Question period Canada, we have a few things lined up. Happy Easter. Hope the weather is good in your area. It's uh, rain and sleet here in Nova Scotia, not pleasant, but I've heard that it's lovely across the country in different parts. So we're going to jump in today into the Canadian Senate. That's uh, been in the headlines a lot lately because Paul Liev and his army are having a tough time getting any bills to pass. Trudeau is saying that it's uh, nonpartisan these days. That's a crock. That's not true. Um, but we do have some interesting videos that we're going to jump into. And we've got this that we're going to be kicking it off with. Just when you thought the unelected Senate couldn't become more of a partisan dumping ground, Justin Trudeau is proving us wrong yet again. The self anointed reforming prime minister who boldly declared the Senate and partisanship must go has now appointed over 80 loyal liberal allies and financial benefactors to the disgraced upper chamber. Far from the transformative reforms he once claimed to champion, Trudeau's piecemeal tweaks have only further corroded public trust in an anti-democratic institution that has no place in a modern democracy. The hypocrisy is astounding, while paying lip service to accountability and independence. The PM has quietly ensured the Senate remains a partisan bastion to reward liberal loyalists. After 81 cynical appointments in eight years, Trudeau's disgraceful Senate charade has been exposed as nothing more than smoke and mirrors. Meaningful reform remains an unfulfilled pipe dream as the PM prioritizes political self-interest over democratic principles. It's clear Trudeau lacks the courage to take decisive action. His superficial tinkering and broken promises continue to erode Canadians' faith in Parliament. The only viable reform is outright abolition. It's time to consign this affront to democracy to the dustbin of history where it belongs. Welcome back to Street Politics Canada. Trudeau promised to reform the Senate and make it less partisan, but his so-called independent appointments tell a far different story. At least six of Trudeau's Senate picks are alumni of his own Trudeau Foundation. This includes the hand-picked leadership team that has run the Senate for Trudeau over the past four years. The partisan nepotism doesn't end there. Trudeau also appointed a 20-year Liberal MP and multiple maximum donors to the Liberal Party's Team Trudeau. After stacking the Senate with over 80 loyal Liberals, it's clear Trudeau's reforms were never meant to make the institution actually independent. Rather, he has transformed the Red Chamber into his own partisan creature. The Senate now serves as a haven where Trudeau can reward longtime friends, allies, and donors with cushy patronage positions devoid of accountability. When Trudeau first removed Liberal senators from the party's National Caucus back in 2014, many saw it as a stunt, a way to gain political points without enacting real change. Perhaps we should have listened more closely. Trudeau wasn't interested in reforming the Senate to serve Canadians better. He simply wanted to reshape it to serve his own political ends. That much has become abundantly clear as Trudeau has stacked the Senate with sympathetic independence over his last gang, eight I'm years well as Prime today. Minister. Nearly three quarters the of the current though. senators were appointed by Trudeau, many of whom have clear links to the Liberal Party despite claiming to be nonpartisan. Take Trudeau's very first appointee, Peter Harder. He was a lifetime Liberal Party member and bureaucrat. Harder went on to serve as the government's representative in the Senate for four years, essentially acting as a partisan mouthpiece for Trudeau. Many of the so-called independent senators appointed by Trudeau also happen to be former liberal candidates, donors, and advisors. His 81st appointment this week fits the pattern, yet another loyal liberal cloaked in the guise of independence. When controversial bills have come up on issues like medically assisted dying and carbon taxes, Trudeau's hand-picked independents consistently side with the liberal government's position. Meanwhile, the remaining conservative opposition is increasingly marginalized in the Trudeau stacked Senate. The advisory boards recommending nominees are clearly designed to produce liberal allies, not genuine independents. The partisan leanings of Trudeau's appointees reveal the truth. Independence is the exception rather than the norm. We exposed in a previous video how Trudeau has rigged the Senate with a hand-picked member who donated thousands to his foundation. His appointment of a wealthy businessman who gave over $75,000 to the Liberal Party completely exposes the partisan interests behind Trudeau's claimed independence. Trudeau's reforms have not made the Senate any less partisan, they've simply turned it into a chamber of covert liberal Stupid partisans guys. operating under the pretense of independence while furthering the government's agenda. The advisory boards that recommend Senate appointees were supposed to be independent. In reality, they are heavily influenced by the Prime Minister's office. The majority of appointees are sympathetic to the Liberals. Rather than ending partisanship, Trudeau has merely changed the Senate's stripes. Under this new Trudeau-molded Senate, the legislative process has become more chaotic and expensive. With senators acting as individuals rather than organized parties, there is less efficient coordination and more gridlock. The costs of operating the Senate have ballooned by $50 million since Trudeau took office. Meanwhile, 
there is diminished opposition to thoroughly scrutinize and debate government legislation. A functional Westminster parliamentary system relies on both the government and opposition in the upper house. Trudeau has weakened the Senate's ability to properly perform this role. The conservatives warn that many of Trudeau's appointees are liberal hacks and partisans masquerading as independents. They argue a transparently partisan Senate is preferable to one that pretends to be above the fray while still doing the government's bidding. I have frequently termed this Justin Trudeau's fake independent Senate because I really don't think that it has been in any way Senate reform. I think many Canadians, myself included, want to see real Senate reform. But this is not that, said Denise Batters, a conservative senator from Saskatchewan. At least an openly partisan Senate is honest about its political leanings rather than hiding behind a myth of nonpartisanship. Trudeau's Senate appointees may claim to be neutral technocrats, but their actions and connections reveal most are loyal liberals. Recent polls reveal that Trudeau's liberals face potential defeat in the next election. This has cast serious doubts on the future of his so-called Senate reforms. It is becoming increasingly likely that his partisan meddling with the upper chamber will be short-lived. Once seated, a conservative government would swiftly restore the Senate to its traditional role, ending Trudeau's failed experiment. Canadians can look forward to a return to proper partisan alignment in the red chamber under a conservative mandate. Conservatives understand that effective governance requires clear government and opposition parties in the Senate, not Trudeau's sham independence. A conservative-led Senate would feature defined conservative and opposition benches, restoring true accountability. Unlike Trudeau's unilateral tinkering, the conservatives would pursue comprehensive reforms to enhance the Senate's transparency and democratic legitimacy. This would curb the partisan abuses and waste that the liberals have exacerbated. The prospect of a return to conservative leadership has sparked hopes that Trudeau's damaging Senate reforms will be reversed in due course. The coming election could mark the beginning of the end for his vanity project and pave the way for meaningful Senate modernization guided by conservative principles. The durability of Trudeau's changes remains uncertain. What is clear is that the new Senate was never meant to be independent or nonpartisan. It was designed to provide a veneer of independence while still advancing the liberal agenda. Rather than genuine reform, Trudeau has given us superficial change at best. The Senate still lacks accountability and transparency. Canadians are stuck with an upper chamber that serves political interests rather than the national interest. Trudeau's superficial tinkering with the antiquated Senate is an insult to Canadians. This undemocratic oligarchy should be abolished entirely and replaced with a body that truly represents the diverse interests of this nation. In the meantime, Trudeau's partisan lackeys continue pilfering taxpayer dollars to fuel their expense accounts and cushy lifestyles. The Red Chamber remains a den of literal yes-men lining their pockets while failing to provide meaningful oversight. Canadians are sick and tired of this band of unelected liberal sycophants pretending to be independent while obeying their master's orders. We need drastic reforms to transform this elitist club into an assembly of elected representatives who serve citizens, not the prime minister's cronies. But Trudeau is too spineless and self-interested to ever lead these necessary reforms. His appointments have only strengthened the Senate's culture of unaccountable partisan patronage. After eight years of disgraceful inaction, it's clear Trudeau is beholden to the old boys club. If Trudeau had any integrity, he would listen to Canadians and abolish the Senate immediately. In its place, we need an elected body giving voice to First Nations, women, visible minorities, and other underrepresented groups, not just wealthy liberal donors. Until this dream is realized, the partisan circus of Trudeau's Senate will continue wasting billions while serving the liberal elite. Trudeau's complicity in this tragedy shows he is unfit to be prime minister. His Senate scam has gone on long enough. The time has come for real change. Well, that's all for now. How deep does Trudeau's corruption run when he packs the Senate with donor cronies? Let us know what you think in the comments below. And if you haven't, please subscribe and leave a like for this video. Your support helps us continue our work. You can also follow us on Twitter, where we post stuff we can't post on YouTube. You can find the link in the description below. Thanks again for your support. I will see you. All right, so that's pretty interesting. A little piece on what has been going on in the Senate the last few years. And now let's take a look at some Senate highlights. Uh, that's what we have up next. Hey voters, what's up? Aaron here, Question Period Canada. We watch the Senate, not many people follow that. It's super interesting and super important. These are some highlights from the latest Question Period. In case you don't know who Donald Plett is, hang around here for a minute and you will. Gold, I hope you don't consider this a partisan question. Operation Père Noël is a charity in your province of Quebec that provides presents to children in need, gifts. Last week, they said 27,000 children under the age of 17 had already sent in their requests, an increase of 2,000 over last year. 
The charity also said it is surprised how many children are asking Santa for basic needs, not gifts or toys. Children are asking for food for their families and snacks. A large number of children are asking for snow boots, snow suits and boots. One teenager wrote to ask for deodorant and a toothbrush. This is in Canada, leader. As a father and grandfather, this is heartbreaking. Will the Trudeau government reverse course and end its inflationary carbon tax on food and provide a brighter new year for children across Canada? Thank you for the question. Uh, the question, or at least the preamble to the question, is troubling. The, the thought that anybody in this country, but certainly children, um, feel that instead of getting the gifts that we all want to give our children and grandchildren at holiday times, um, they're asking for, for food and clothing. It's heartbreaking. I'm a father and grandfather. You don't have to be a father and grandfather, grandmother, grandparent, or parent uh, to, to feel that. Um, and the cost of living is posing enormous challenges for all of Canadians. And uh, I know everyone in this chamber uh, hopes and wishes that that will alleviate soon. Uh, it is not the responsibility of the government, however, uh, to, uh, it's not the ability of the government to fix uh, all problems that we are facing. And the Thank carbon you. tax in the position of this government is Thank not you. the cause of this unfortunate. Thank you, Senator Gold. That's a bit of a dismal way to start off the highlights, but it's tough times out there for Canadians. Remember the Canada Cup, though? This senator does. Senator Gold, Canada hosted five Canada Cup international hockey tournaments between 1976 and 1991. The Canada Cup, the trophy itself, has not been awarded in over three decades. I think it's time to dust off this national treasure and repurpose it as Playon's top prize. Would the government be support supportive of rewarding the trophy to Playon? Could you raise this possibility with Hockey Canada and Minister St. Ange? Senator Gold. Well, my understanding is that with regard to the Canada Cup, uh, the Department of Canadian Heritage has already been reached out to Hockey Canada uh, regarding its use. The Cup is not the property of the government, as you would know, so I would encourage Play On to also contact Ho Hockey Canada directly. And I understand that Minister Qualtro's team has already been in contact with Mr. Hill from Play On and has shared with him the contact information for Hockey Canada. So, sorry to interrupt everybody, but I've got a quick story about um, the 87 Canada Cup, one of the best memories I have have in my mind. My dad and I were up watching late at night. I was up allowed to stay up to watch it, and it was in overtime, and Gretzky to Lemieux, oh my God, what a memory. Um, we need to bring back the Canada Cup. That was a pretty exciting thing. Sorry to interrupt, guys. It's definitely a different atmosphere than the Commons. Donald Plett has another question, this time about the economy. Leader, in October, the Bank of Canada estimated that Canada's economy would grow by 0.8% in the third quarter of this year. Instead, Statistics Canada reported our GDP actually fell 1.1% in the third quarter of annualized basis, on an annualized basis. As the Bank of Montreal said last week, Canada's economy is struggling to grow, managing to just keep its head above recession waters. Our economy and our people are struggling, but we are stuck with an NDP Liberal government dead set on inflationary debt, deficits, carbon taxes, and widespread mismanagement. Aren't we, leader? No, we are not. Uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago that members in this chamber will remember how uh, the, uh, uh, the opposition in the Senate was uh, predicting uh, inflation uh, going to the roof, it's come down. In, in predicting inflation, it's come down. It seems that, that, that the, the management of, this, of the worldwide economic crisis post-pandemic of this government uh, is all, it, it, w when it proves to be uh, successful, uh, is ignored. It's as if 
Um, we live in Groundhog Day, and one simply recycles the, one recycles the old uh, talking points regardless of what the actual circumstances show. Life is hard for Canadians, but the economy is doing uh, fairly well compared to other G7 countries, and it is, it is the opinion of the government that the uh, prudent, responsible measures that it took in the fall economic statement uh, are uh, to some large degree responsible for us navigating these tr tough waters as we have. If you're as curious about the Senate as I am, this is the spot. We cover the daily question periods from the Commons, all of the question periods from the Senate. We make a lot of other videos, some funny shorts. We're here covering the news from Parliament in a fun way as we learn. That's it. My name's Aaron. This is Question Period Canada. Like, subscribe. We'll be back with more videos. Catch you next time. Thanks for watching. All right, guys, so now what we're going to do is we're going to jump into a tour of the Senate, and then we're going to watch some question periods from the Senate. They're not as long as the question periods from the House of Commons, but we're going to do a tour of the Senate. I haven't seen this video. I took a very quick peek to see if it would be something that we might want to show here. We do want to show it, so let's take a peek at that. So we're currently in center block, but more specifically, we're actually in the Senate foyer, which is the space that as you enter up through the east entrance of center block, um, you come into the Senate foyer before you proceed into the Senate's antechamber and the chamber itself. The artwork in this space depicts the monarchs, um, or British monarchs, since Canada became a British possession and then through confederation into present day. So this, this is like the royal side as opposed to the House of Commons on the other side. Exactly, because the Senate is the upper chamber, so we have a connection to the British royal family. Um, and so having depictions of them within our Senate foyer is very important. Uh, so this portrait is of Queen Elizabeth II. It's actually on loan to the Senate from the National Capital Commission and has been since 2006. It's part of their crown collection. The reason that I wanted to point this one out is because out of all the paintings in the Senate foyer, this is actually the only one painted by a woman and by a Canadian artist. Um, it was painted by a woman named Lilius Torrance Newton, who was a member of the Bieber Hall Group. Um, in the 1950s, and she actually traveled to England to have a sitting with the Queen for this particular painting. And then the other monarchs are around the hall here? We have exactly. So the other monarchs are in the Senate foyer, and for the most part, their consorts are actually located in the balcony above us. Another item worth looking at is yep. the seniority board. So this object on the wall is referred to as the Senate Seniority Board because what it does is identify all the names of current senators by their date of appointment, which in this case is what determines seniority. And we actually didn't know a lot about this particular object, but about two years ago we had the top part here, the Speaker's Arch, um, sent out for conservation treatment. And when the Conservators were looking at it, um, they realized that there were hidden names under layers of paint. So they took um, UV and infrared photographs and they could see lettering hidden in behind the paint. Um, so you can see up top we have the name of the current speaker, but if I take this off, you'll see the name of J.J. Ross, who was speaker between 1891 and 1896. Um, so all of a sudden we went from not knowing much about this particular object to realizing it probably dates back to at least 1891, um, if not earlier because there's some indication that there's actually more names hidden behind this particular one. So what we believe the practice was is they would, um, when a new speaker was appointed, they would just paint over the previous name and then paint on the new speaker's name. Um, and then after time they stopped this practice and would attach a board probably with nails. Um, and so what we do now is because we still want to be able to preserve this but then still show the name of the current speaker, we attach a separate board with magnets on it to protect the object. Yeah, it's a beautiful piece.
One of my favorite parts of the foyer is the, uh, the stained glass over the, the yes. entrance way. Let's have a look at that tomorrow. So, so Tamara, this is the Diamond Jubilee window. What can you tell us about this? So this window was put in in 2012 to commemorate Queen Elizabeth's Diamond Jubilee anniversary. Um, you can see on one side there's a depiction of Queen Elizabeth and then underneath is the current center block and on the other side is Queen Victoria who um, was queen when Canada became a country and then underneath is a depiction of the original center block which burnt down in 1916 and then this building was built in its place in the 1920s. Mm, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. There was a window in there before. It basically just had leaded glass, um, and so it's actually in storage right now, but it was a more simple um, window in its place, but with the same silhouette and outline. There's also the mace uh, under, underneath it there. Right underneath the Diamond Jubilee window is a replica of the Senate mace. So while this one stays on display underneath the Jubilee window, um, the actual mace uh, is in the Speaker's office or in the Senate chamber while the Senate is in session. Well, let's, let's go in and see the, the chamber now. So right now we're walking from the Senate foyer through the antechamber and into the Senate chamber. Okay, so tomorrow now we're in the antechamber of the Senate of uh, Canada. And what can you tell us about the, the sculptures here? Yeah, so the antechamber has um, busts of some very important senators. This one right here is actually a bust of Corinne Wilson, who was the first female senator to be appointed. And she was appointed in the 1930s after the person's case made it possible for women to become senators. And then just in behind me is a bust of James Gladstone, who was the first Indigenous um, senator to be appointed to the Senate, and he was appointed in the 1950s. So Tamara, we're here in the Senate chambers, and, and this is where we would normally only be allowed as commoners when the Senate is sitting, is that correct? That's correct. Um, so typically members of the yeah, public stay the on this side of the gold bar. Gold. So for instance, if you're coming here on the public tour it route, this is their big, stop like in the Senate chamber. The but today we're lucky enough Senate. to get to go beyond the gold bar um, and look at the Senate chamber in more detail. Go ahead. The Senate chamber is one of the most significant and ornate spaces within center block. Um, just looking at the decorative elements, you have the gilt ceiling, there's a bust of Queen Victoria right above the throne area. There's also detailed carving on the Senate chamber desks as well as the wall paneling. Um, another uh, aspect of the space that's worth highlighting is that the furniture in here is actually original to this space for the most part. When the architect designed the building, he designed or selected most of the furniture to go inside. And so we like to respect that as much as possible so that senators from the 1920s and present day are still using the same furniture and you have that continuity within the space itself. As soon as you step in here, you, you're, you see these fantastic paintings, which I understand are on loan from the, the War Museum, the Beaver Book uh, collection. But they, they just dominate the room almost. Eh? Exactly. So these eight paintings have been on display in the Senate chamber since the 1920s. They're actually on loan to the Senate from the War Museum and part of the Beaver Book collection of war art. During the First World War, Lord Beaverbrook established the War Art Memorial Fund to commemorate artistically Canada's war effort. And these are part of those collection. And we've been fortunate enough for the past almost 100 years to have them on display in the Senate chamber. Well, they're amazing, amazing pieces, yeah. yeah. And I understand they're, they're not uh, following you over to the... Uh... No, unfortunately, um, due to size, because they're so large, they won't fit in our new building. So this is one of our last opportunities to be able to see them in the Senate chamber before the building's closed for renovation. This painting on the end is the only one that was painted by a female artist. So I like to bring attention to this one. So this is on leave. It's actually the, the only interior scene and it was painted by an artist named Claire Atwood. Um, from my understanding, it was felt that it was inappropriate for women to be on the battle scene really depicting what it was actually like, so she was able to depict an interior scene from the First World War. 
I think it's worth noting that when the first building burnt down in 1916, Canadians were in Europe fighting the First World War. So then a few years later, when they were rebuilding this building, memories of the First World War were very present in Canadians' minds. And so it was very important to document and commemorate the sacrifices that Canadian soldiers had made just a few years earlier. And that's why these are part of the reason why these paintings are in here. When you're into this room as well, this gorgeous ceiling above us is, is really remarkable. One of the most striking features in the Senate chamber is the gilt ceiling. So it is a coffered ceiling and then inside the coffers you can see thematic depictions referencing England, France, Scotland, Wales, Ireland and of course Canada. It's beautiful. Let's, let's move on to the speaker's chair and the, uh, the thrones. So here at the north end of the Senate chamber, you can see the monarch and consort's throne, which if a member of the British royal family were to visit Canada, um, this is where they would sit in the Senate chamber or their representative, the governor general, um, and his or her spouse would use these thrones. And then in front here is the speaker's chair, which is used by the speaker of the Senate when um, the Senate is in session. Um, it was actually a practice of the Senate up until the 1920s for the Speaker to take their chair with them. And then in 1923, they decided to end that practice. And uh, this chair has been in use ever since. But there are other Speaker's chairs floating around as a result of the former practice. So is it, was this designed by uh, the architect John, John Pearson and Omar Marchand, do you, do you know? No, so this one actually wasn't. It was designed by the chief architect of public works, Thomas Rankin, um, in the 1920s, but for use in this space. Um, so it's a little bit, it's one of the exceptions from the Pearson designed or Pearson selected furniture. And, and when the governor general or, or the monarch is here, the speaker says, does it stay there or is it moved out of the way? No, it is removed if uh, the monarch or the governor general is here so that the um, governor general or monarch can use the thrones. I just think one of the most interesting things if you've been in the House of Commons and you've uh, been in the Senate chamber is you notice um, the level of debate. It's um, a lot more respectful uh, because of the fact that there are 105 senators versus 338 members of parliament. Uh, you can actually hear what is being said in the chamber. You don't necessarily need your microphone uh, because the chamber is uh, a lot smaller. Okay, so what happens here? During a Senate sitting, you have uh, senators from the government side on the right side of the speaker and directly opposite on the left side are the opposition senators. Directly in front of us, you'll see the table and the people that sit on the table dur um, during the Senate sitting are table officers. At the head of the table, the clerk of the Senate, the clerk of the Parliament, and on his left and right side are reading clerks who help with keeping track of uh, Time, speaking times for each senator. Uh, directly behind the table, you'll have two sets of tables, and those are for stenographers who are responsible for capturing everything that is said in the Senate for the purposes of our Hansard and our, our debates, the official record of the Senate. Behind the stenographers are uh, is uh, the table for the Usher of the Black Rod. And the Usher of the Black Rod's role during the Senate sitting is to um, enforce the rules and help maintain order and decorum. Well, gang, we're going to skip the, the credits of that video. I, I thought the girl next door uh, hostess, I did not find her terrifying or scary. It seems that the audience seems, seems, seems to think that kind of funny. Uh, but yeah, so now we're going to jump into some uh, Senate question periods. And we've got one ready to go. We're going to kick it off right away. Senator Platts. Let's go. Leader, yesterday Minister Jolie told the Toronto Star that the NDP Trudeau government will stop all arms exports to Israel. Israel's ambassador to Canada said in response that this will and I quote, actually weaken our possibility to defend ourselves against the terrorism of Hamas. Leader, this is a disgraceful betrayal by the Trudeau government of a fellow democracy, a long-standing friend and ally. 
during one of their darkest hours. Prime Minister Trudeau has turned his back on Israel to appease his NDP coalition partners, didn't he? That's his main motivation leader, isn't it? Senator Gold. Uh, no, no, it is not. Uh, and uh, I know that the uh, uh, actions and the decision uh, in, the, in the House Friday caused considerable consternation within my community. Um, uh, believe me, <laughs> I know. Uh, at the same time, and I, and I know that the uh, uh, ambassador to Israel has expressed uh, his uh, uh, disagreement, strong disagreement, uh, with aspects of that. Uh, the fact remains, however, that a proper reading of the resolution that was uh, passed uh, reaffirms Canada's long-standing position with regard to this dispute, one that is tearing communities apart, pitting them against each other, and I'm hoping, as we all do, that peace will be restored as soon as possible. Senator Platt. Well, I am indeed sorry, Leader, that you are taking the brunt of the hurt here because of an incompetent Prime Minister, you an MP House Father. Prime Minister Trudeau has no moral compass, and we see that time and again. In taking this action against Israel, he is showing everyone that he puts his own political self-interest above all else. He will turn on a friend at a time of need, and he is willing to bring embarrassment on Canada by diminishing our reputation. Is it worth betraying Canadians, Canada's principles, to hang on to power? Senator Gold. <clears throat> Uh, that is not a, a, a proper characterization of what uh, transpired over the days leading up to the uh, vote in the House of Commons. And again, I know all senators will join me in bemoaning uh, uh, and, uh, the, the, uh, the violence uh, that it took place uh, from October 7th, uh, on October 7th and beyond, and hope and pray for peace. Senator Husakos. In order to have peace, you have to stand on the right side of history. Senator Gold, after months of the Trudeau government trying to play all sides in the ongoing war between Israel and terrorist Hamas, it culminated Monday night with a motion in the House of Commons that sends a terrible message to our friends and allies. Moreover, it signals to terrorist Hamas that they will be rewarded for future attacks like October 7th and the ongoing captivity of innocent people. But perhaps the most egregious in the message, it was sent to people right here in Canada. And we've seen the result of that with this morning's publication of the worst kind of anti-Semitic trope in La Presse, the likes of which we haven't seen since the 1930s and I never thought I'd see here in our country. Senator Gold, does your government take any responsibility for the level of anti-Semitism that is being validated and unleashed in this country by creating an equivocation that somehow Hamas, terrorist Hamas, and democratic Israel are on the same footing. Senator Gold. <clears throat> that is not the position of this government, and it, and it, is, and it is deeply disturbing for, for uh, those allegations to be made. The hurt within the Jewish community and the pro-Israel community is deep as, and, and deep and powerful. And, uh, and uh, but this government is a steadfast ally of Israel, has been for decades and decades and decades. And regardless of the attempts by your party, which go back decades to use it as a wedge issue for electoral purposes, the, the, the friendship and deep relationships that Canada has with Israel, which have endured despite changes of government and despite the rhetoric, uh, shall re remain. Senator Husakos. The only one engaging in partisanship is your government. Senator Gold, moments ago, your own Minister of Heritage was asked about this despicable cartoon in the media scrum. Not only did she refuse to condemn it, she actually said that it was a matter of bad timing. Amazing. <laughs> Sorry, is there a good time for this kind of anti-Semitism, yeah. Senator Gold, in the eyes of your government? Is there a good time? Will the minister apologize for this? And will your government take responsibility for its contributing to the kind of Jew hatred that's going on in Canada? Here, here, here. Senator Gold. My understanding is, uh, I was shocked when I saw the, 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 the this, this one. I'm, may I begin? 
I was shocked when I, uh, when I saw the, uh, the, the cartoon by Chaplow this morning. It's the first paper that I read in the morning. My understanding is that it has been taken down and justly condemned, as you did in this chamber. Senator Coyle. Senator Gold, in a recently published Globe and Mail article, Tabitha Bull, President and CEO of the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business, said that the Arrive Can controversy should be the catalyst for changing the Indigenous business program. The procurement strategy for Indigenous businesses is a set-aside program meant to support Indigenous businesses and workers. Any inappropriate uses of this program harm reconciliation efforts and take opportunities away from Indigenous businesses, which are the targets of the program. Senator Gold, what will the Government of Canada do to build better safeguards into the procurement strategy for Indigenous business program in order to reduce future abuses of the program, no matter what comes of the recent Arrive Can controversy? Senator Gold. Thank you for the question. Um, I understand that, as you would know, that Indigenous Services Canada maintains a directory of Indigenous organizations which supports the Government of Canada in achieving its goal of 5% procurement from Indigenous-led businesses. When a business registers with the Indigenous Business Directory, they must demonstrate to the ISC that it is both 51% Indigenous-owned and controlled. I understand that at the request of PSPC, post-award audits are underway and a work plan for the audits is being implemented. The government is also currently in the midst of consulting on the transformative Indigenous procurement strategy, which also includes a review of Indigenous business directory. And the government will keep on engaging with Indigenous partners on improvements and transformative approaches to Indigenous procurement. Senator Coyle. Thank you for that answer. Um, you've mentioned the consultation, the uh, consultation process that's going on to review the program. Could you tell us what's being done in terms of consulting with Indigenous businesses themselves, Indigenous communities and Indigenous organizations in that sort of evaluation and any kind of updating that will be done on this important program? Senator Gold. Well, thank you for the question. In the brief time, let me just uh, uh, list some of the groups with whom our consultations are ongoing. Representatives from modern treaty rights holders, representatives from national indigenous organizations, representatives of indigenous organizations with technical expertise in economic development, interested indigenous leaders or their delegates or representatives, and of course indigenous businesses and entrepreneurs. Senator Lafreda. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The question is for the government representative in the Senate. Senator Gold, it's tax season. Tax experts will be called upon in the coming weeks to help Canadians file their taxes. But we also know that up to 12% of Canadians currently do not file their tax returns, which is why since 2018 the CRA has been delivering the Simple File service allowing Canadians to auto-file their tax return over the phone. Budget 2023 announced that the service will be expanding so that 2 million Canadians will now be eligible. In 2022, only 53,000 returns were filed using this service. Five years into the program, what assessment has been made by the CRA on the success of Simple File? Do we have any idea of the cost of running this program and what investments will be needed as it, as it expands in the coming years? Senator Gold. <clears throat> well, thank you. I, though I don't have specific information about what audits or re reviews are currently underway, I can uh, tell you, Senator, and thank you for your question, that already uh, in the period between February 5th, 2024 to March 28, over 18,000 people have filed their taxes using Simpl Simple File uh, by phone. And th it's an important program and one that uh, we hope Canadians will take full advantage of. Um, it helps especially lower income individuals uh, access the benefits and the credits to which they'd be entitled by, uh, by, by filing and filing in a, in a more simplified manner. Uh, manner. Senator Lafreda. Thank you for that answer. What is the agency's most recent estimation of the number of Canadians who don't file their taxes? Is there a breakdown by province? And do we know how many would be eligible for these benefits? The issue of non-tax filer, filers has been raised, often been raised at our Nas National Finance Committee, especially with respect to lower income Canadians who might be missing out on valuable benefits which they are entitled to, like the Canada Child Benefit or the Guaranteed Income Supplement. Senator Gold. <clears throat> well, uh, the only information that I have, and it's not perhaps uh, as up-to-date as I would hope, was that about 12% of Canadians do not file their tax returns, uh, but I'm not aware of any 
updated estimates, and I don't have any information, unfortunately, with regard to breakdowns of provinces. Senator Dejeuner. Senator Dejeuner. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Mr. Leader, Justin Trudeau's liberals are killing the fishing industry in eastern Quebec and the Maritimes. It is catastrophic for families and business owners. For reasons of security, the minister of uh, the minister of uh, fisheries and oceans is doing nothing more than uh, making the situation worse. I'd like to know why the prime minister has not asked the RCMP to intervene rather than allowing criminal elements to be uh, to remain in the industry. They are very easy to identify, Senator Gold. Thank you for the question and thank you for underscoring the challenge that many communities are facing with regard to illegal activities in the fishing industry. I do not have any information with regard to any particular initiatives or investigations that are underway, but I will definitely speak to the minister about your concerns which are very valid. Senator Dejeuner, you know that it's well known that uh, elvers are, uh, that poaching, elvers are, uh, elvers are being poached by criminal elements and this, their catch is being sent to Toronto and then abroad. These catches could easily be intercepted at the Toronto airport the Minister of Security could intervene. Senator Gould, thank you for the question. As I've said many times, colleagues, the premise of your question uh, your question suggests that no action is being taken. However, it is always a challenge in major centers such as the uh, ports of Montreal or in airports to inspect every single item that goes out of the country. But I will raise the question with the Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Senator Gold, yesterday the Auditor General of Canada tabled a report on housing in First Nations communities, which found that ISC and CMHC have made little progress over the past two decades and are not likely to close the housing gap by 2030. Another report on First Nations Inuit uh, and Inuit policing program found that Public Safety Canada has poorly managed the program and the RCMP has not been able to fully staff positions funded through it. Will the federal government finally allocate the necessary funding and resources to address what Ms. Hogan has described as a distressing and persistent pattern of failure on federal programs intended to support Indigenous people? Senator Gold. Well, thank you for your question. Uh, in both, uh, both of the reports really painted a very a disturbing picture uh, of the progress that has not been made, though, though some has indeed, but the progress, I should, I should say, that still needs to be made in those files. And, and the government has accepted all of the recommendations uh, of the Auditor General with regard to her report on housing and her report on policing. With regard to the financial dimensions, the issues are quite different, uh, Senator. Um, there is no question that the gap uh, uh, that has persisted for decades, if not centuries, between uh, uh, adequate housing in Indigenous communities uh, and elsewhere uh, has now been stabilized thanks to significant uh, initiatives by this government, uh, which now offers the hope that uh, with more efforts and resources, uh, that gap will, will be narrowed. Uh, the issue with policing is more complicated <laughs> engaging as it does in so many, as, as we know, at the provinces and territories. Senator Francis. Oui, merci. Ma question s'adresse au leader du gouvernement. Monsieur le leader, on apprenait en des derniers jours que... Senator Cagnon, this question is for the leader of the government. In the last few week, weeks, we've understood that the former Minister of Justice, David Lametti, ordered a new trial in the case of Judge Delisle, a Quebec judge. S Minister Lametti at the time said that there was reason to believe that there was a miscarriage of justice. We have just learned, however, 
that the Criminal Conviction Review Group arrived at the conclusion that there was no miscarriage of justice and no justification for ordering a new trial. There was no new evidence presented uh, to the effect that there had been a miscarriage of justice. How is it that the minister could justify his conclusion that a miscarriage of justice did indeed take place? Senator Gold, thank you for the question. According to the information that I have received the Minister of Justice at the time received not only the report from the Criminal Conviction Review Group but also legal uh, opinions from two former judges, two retired judges that is. And without being able to disclose everything unfortunately because of Confidality, confidentiality considerations. I have been told that according to the input of these two retired judges, because of their legal opinion, notwithstanding the report from the group, Mr. Lemedi made that decision. Senator Carignan, this is a public decision. It's of public interest. It's a uh, it has to do with trust in the justice system. Will the government commit to producing the two legal opinions of these eminent legal experts? The government benefits from this confidelity. Can it not disclose the information and lift the confidentiality agreement? Thank you for the question. Decision. The decision is in the hands of the current Minister of Justice and according to the information I've received, he does not intend to disclose or make public these two legal opinions uh, ordered by his predecessor. Second, anti-Israel protests in Toronto led to the cancellation of an event hosted by the Prime Minister to honour Italy's Prime Minister. Two G7 leaders and they could not meet safely in Canada. Open displays of hate are taking place on our streets on a regular basis. Terrible acts of violence and intimidation continue to target Jewish schools, synagogues and cultural events. Last fall, the Trudeau government announced $10 million for an expanded security infrastructure program to help places of worship and cultural centers enhance their safety. Leader, how much of the money announced last year has been spent to date? Not promised, Leader, how much has been spent? Senator Gold. <clears throat> well, I don't know exactly how much has been spent, uh, Senator uh, Platt, but thank you for your question. It is a great preoccupation in my community and a great sense of distress that for many, many, many years, indeed, more than a decade, uh, we've had to uh, uh, have security at our places of worship and at our schools. But I can tell you that in my own community of Montreal, my community has already announced uh, the, the amounts that it has received and how it is being invested. So I cannot speak for other communities, but I know that the, uh, the support that the government is giving to, our institute, to the institution of the Jewish community is very well appreciated and uh, is being utilized uh, quickly and with dispatch uh, for the security uh, of our community. Senator Platt. For the entire country, not just for your community. So my answer, my question is still left unanswered. The Trudeau government is good at making promises and not following through on them. Ukraine is a prime example. In the days following October 7th terrorist attack on Israel by Hamas, conservatives asked the Trudeau government to update Canadians on whether the threat assessment of the Integrated Terrorism Assessment Centre has been re-evaluated. Leader, this was a reasonable request. Why haven't Canadians been given that information five months later? Senator Gold. <clears throat> Well, thank you for your question, and I'm actually very glad that, you, uh, that you've asked, uh, continue to, uh, to focus attention on the important challenges that Ukraine is, is facing. Now, time does not permit me uh, to list all of the actual uh, uh, assistance that has been provided, military assistance to Ukraine, 
numbers of bullets and ammunition. I have it in my hand, so if you continue to ask me questions, I'll be happy to start uh, going through the list for your benefit. Senator Kutcher. Thank you. Senator Kutcher. Senator Gold, a panel of experts chaired by Sir Mark Walport from the UK began a review into a very limited component of the government COVID-19 pandemic response. We were told that the panel's report would be available by the first quarter of 2024. Well, that's now. Would you please tell us when we can expect this report to be made available to us? And could you please provide this chamber with a list of witnesses that the panel has heard from to date? Senator Gold. Well, thank you for your question, uh, Senator. I don't have that information at, at hand, but I will certainly endeavor to, to uh, inform myself in, as quickly as I can. Senator Kutcher. Senator Gold, the mandate for this panel was very, very limited. It's definitely not a comprehensive review of our government's response to the pandemic. Can you please tell us why this government did not initiate a comprehensive inquiry into the way Canada responded to the pandemic, similarly to the reviews carried out in Australia and by the British Medical Association in the United Kingdom? Can we expect the government to follow these examples? If so, when? And if not, why not? Senator Gold. <clears throat> well, thank you for your question. I'll certainly add that to, uh, to the questions that I will address to the minister. S Senator Patton. My question is to the government representative in the Senate. Senator Gold, on this International Francophonie Day, I want to ask you about Francophone daycares in Newfoundland and Labrador. According to a Radio Canada article, due to a lack of infrastructure and qualified French-speaking personnel, there is very limited access to French-speaking daycares. The result is that many families are forced to put their children in English-speaking daycares. Since the government is so rightfully proud of its $10 a day ch uh, child care agreements with the various provinces, what is your response to the families who would prefer to send their children to francophone daycares but who are unable to do so? Senator Gold. <clears throat> well, Senator, thank you for your question for underlining uh, and highlighting International Francophone Day. Uh, access to quality child care is important for all children and families, including, and, uh, and, uh, of course, those who are uh, members of official language minority communities. Um, and that's why the government has made sure that all, in all of its bilateral agreements uh, with provinces and territories outside of Quebec, um, the uh, provinces are committed uh, to protect and respect the rights of official language minority communities in that regard. But ultimately, co uh, colleagues, as, as you know, the uh, implementation of these agreements in, in, in the area of child care is the responsibility of the provincial governments. And the, and the federal government will continue to work with them, Newfoundland and others, uh, to ensure that these agreements are successful. Senator Patton. Senator Gold, 5% of the population in Newfoundland and Labrador can carry a conversation in French. And in 2021, 0.7% of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians spoke French at home regularly. In order to maintain or even improve this statistic, what is the government going to do to improve access to French resources in the province? Senator Gold. Well, thank you again for the question. Uh, one of the things that the government does is to support uh, minority language community organizations within the province. And uh, under the Action Plan for Official Languages, the government has invested uh, $1.6 million in eight organizations in Newfoundland and Labrador. And that represents if my, uh, if, uh, uh, approximately a 33% funding increase uh, uh, since uh, 2018. It'll continue to do what it can to support those communities. Senator Husakos. Senator Gold, yesterday, Minister Joly announced that Canada would no longer be exporting weapons to our ally Israel. She pointed to the fact that there was, this was something that was included in the non-binding motion that was adopted Monday in the other place, referring to that motion as, and I quote her, a real thing. I find it beyond troubling that your foreign affairs minister is now literally writing foreign policy on the back of a napkin based on an oppo de motion, not from the official opposition, not from the third party, but from your coalition fourth party partners. But it strikes me as odd that she is so quick to implement something in that motion 
when there was a motion adopted by Parliament seven years ago calling on the government to designate the IRGC as a terrorist entity, and that has yet to be done. So it's amazing how one terrorist group gets some preferential treatment and the democracy gets no preferential treatment. Is that like a real thing? Um, and, the other, and the other motion is a fake one, so the IRGC motion is a fake one, and the motion on Monday for the Minister of Foreign Affairs is a real one? Senator Gold. Uh, well, Senator Housakis, uh, as you know, uh, since January 8th, the government has not approved any new arms export permits to Israel. Uh, and, uh, and, and indeed, what uh, the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs announced was simply uh, an extension or uh, an affirmation of that position that was taken some months ago. Uh, and again, with regard to the uh, listing uh, uh, of, uh, 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 of uh, the regime it's an, uh, as a terrorist entity, as I've said on many occasions, there have been uh, a very robust series of sanctions uh, imposed uh, uh, on many institutions and, and individuals, and the issue of whether further sanctions uh, or listings uh, will uh, continues to be a matter uh, of active review. Senator Husakos. Thank you for confirming what your government is doing and where they stand. The question, though, remains, Senator Gold, it's clear that the IRG is funding Hamas and helped them plan and execute October 7 attack on Israel. So why would your government move so swiftly to suspend arms to our ally Israel, who it says has the right to defend itself, but in five years has taken no action against Israel's enemy and Canada's enemy, which is the IRGC. That sounds like your government is picking sides, Senator Gold, and it's not the right side of history. Senator Gold. The government is not, uh, the government is not picking sides, uh, Senator. Uh, it remains uh, focused very, very much uh, on doing the right thing uh, by way of uh, its sanctions regime and will continue to do so. Senator Martin. Government leader, in a recent report, the parliamentary budget officer said he expects the NDP Trudeau government's deficit will be $46.8 billion for the current fiscal year. As well, a report released in February from Desjardins Securities estimated the deficit for the current fiscal year will reach $50 billion. Desjardins said higher government spending is, quote, almost singularly responsible for the erosion of the federal fiscal forecast, end of quote. Leader, just a few short months ago, Minister Freeland's fall economic statement said the deficit would be $40 billion. Does your government still stand by that figure? Senator Gold. <clears throat> I don't have uh, any current information about any changes to the government's uh, uh, projections. Uh, I am, though, uh, uh, as we all are looking forward to the upcoming budget, which will contain measures uh, to address the challenges that Canadians are continue to face with regard to affordability, cost of food, housing, and so on. Um, it is encouraging. It is encouraging that, the, that uh, as the government uh, had projected, that the rate of inflation continues to fall. Uh, it is encouraging uh, that Canada is projected to have strong economic growth, as I mentioned yesterday, projected to have the strongest in the G7 in the year to come. Uh, all of that, uh, uh, though positive, uh, does not change the fact that Canadians still struggle and that uh, government will continue to do what it can to help Canadians through difficult times. Senator Martin. Well, when recently asked about the Trudeau government's upcoming budget, the governor of the Bank of Canada said, quote, if there are large spending increases, yes, that could start getting in the way of getting inflation back down to target on the timeline we've laid out, end of quote. Leader, will the Trudeau government pay, heed any, pay any heed to this warning? Will your government fix the budget and rein in its wasteful spending? 
doubted. Senator Gold. <coughs> Thank you, The government does not cool, uh, accept the premise that its spending has been wasteful. Its spending has been Thank you. to help Canadians through difficult times, as it did through the pandemic and continues to do through this transition. I am not in a position, and you would not expect me to be able to comment on what may or may not be in the budget, but I have every confidence that the government, uh, that, the, that, that the budget will reflect a practical, prudential, responsible approach to the economic circumstances the country faces. Here. I'm asked if, I, I, I'll ask if we can just check cells to make sure that they're on mute. Senator Labouquain Benson. Honourable Senators, I have the honour to table the answers to the following oral questions. One, response to the oral question asked in the Senate on November 30th, 2021 by the Honourable Senator Patterson concerning Arctic sovereignty. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on May 12th, 2022 by the Honourable Senator Francis concerning the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, Employment and Social Development Canada. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on May 12, 2022 by the Honourable Senator Francis concerning the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, Canada Review Agency. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on October 4th, 2022 by the Honourable Senator McFedrin concerning Canada-China relations. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on October 6, 2022 by the Honourable Senator Martin concerning the retention and recruitment of members of the Canadian Armed Forces. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on October 20th, 2022 by the Honourable Senator Martin concerning Arctic sovereignty. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on October 25th, 2022 by the Honourable Senator Boisvenu concerning reserve troops. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on February 7, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Plett concerning illegal immigration, Public Safety Canada. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on February 7, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Plett concerning illegal immigration, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on February 14, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Simons concerning the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on February 14, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Plett concerning the Roxham Road border crossing. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on February 14, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Martin concerning drug impaired driving. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on March 21, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Marshall concerning military procurement. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on March 28, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Carignan um, concerning the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, P Public Services and Procurement Canada. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on March 28, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Carignan concerning the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Public Safety Canada. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on March 30, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Husakos concerning money laundering. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on April 18th, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Coyle concerning the report of, Ma of the Mass Casualty Commission. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on April 19th, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Bernard concerning the report of the Mass Casualty Commission. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on April 19th, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Boisvenu concerning port a -Peak shooting, support for victims' families. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on May 2nd, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Wu concerning anti-Asian racism. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on May 10th, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Simons concerning digital privacy. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on June 8th, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Dupuy concerning equality in health research. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on June 8th, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Francis concerning renaming the Confederation Bridge. Response to the oral question in the Senate on June 13th, 2023 by the Honourable She's Senator Patterson list, concerning aviation service standards. Response to the oral question asked in the Senate on June 14th, 2023 by the Honourable Senator Down concerning the Canadian Armed Forces retention of members. 
response to the oral question asked in the Senate on June 14th, 2023 by the Honorable Senator Plett concerning the National Immigration Detention Framework. Honorable Senators, an even bigger pile. I have the honor to table the answers to the following written questions. Sorry, guys, this Reply to question number four, dated be. November 23, 2021, appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honorable Senator Plett regarding the Advisory Council on Economic Growth. Reply to question number 82, dated November 23, 2021, appearing on the order and notice paper in the, Honorable, in the name of the Honorable Senator Plett regarding the Prime Minister's autobiography, Privy Council Office. Reply to question number 82, dated November 23rd, 2021. Appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honorable Senator Plett regarding the Prime Minister's autobiography, Global Affairs Canada. Re reply to question number 153, dated April 26, 2022. Appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honorable Senator Plett regarding frozen bank accounts. Reply to question number 180. Dated December 13th, 2022, appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honorable Senator Plett regarding the Privy Council Office. Reply to question 193, dated January 31st, 2023, appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honorable Senator Plett regarding Thanks. federal funding for Canadian media organizations, Canada Revenue Agency. Reply to question number 193, dated January 31st, 2023, appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honourable Senator Plett regarding the federal funding for Canadian media organizations, Canadian heritage. Reply to question number 203, dated February 2nd, 2023, appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honourable Senator Plett regarding immigration consultants, Canada Border Services Agency. Reply to question number 203, dated February 2nd, 2023, appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honourable Senator Plett regarding immigration consultants, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. Reply to question number 206, dated February 2nd, 2023, appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honourable Senator Platt regarding Library and Archives Canada. Reply to the question number 209, dated February 2nd, 2023, on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honourable Senator Platt regarding Roxham Road, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. Reply to question number 209, dated February 2nd, 2023, appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honourable Senator Plett regarding Roxham Road, Public Safety Canada, and Canada Border Agency. Reply to question number 211, dated February 16th, 2023, appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honourable Senator Plett regarding the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Reply to question number 215, dated March 8, 2023, appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honourable Senator Plett regarding foreign interference or influence. Reply to question number 224, dated March 30, 2023, appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honourable Senator Plett re regarding the Can Canada Financial Crimes Agency. Reply to question number 241, dated September 19th, 2023, appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honourable Senator Plett regarding the Firearms Buyback Program, Employment and Social Development Canada. Reply to question number 241, dated September 19th, 2023, appearing on the order paper and notice paper in the name of the Honourable Senator Plett regarding the Firearms Buyback Program, Public Safety Canada. Reply to question number 241, dated September 19th, 2023. All right, so um, <clears throat> I've had enough of that lady reading those letters, um, and there's two minutes more of her doing the exact same thing, and then they adjourn. So we're getting rid of that, and we're going into the next Senate question period, because I think that's going to be more interesting. So we'll period de question. Question period. Senator Platt. Government leader, in 2021, the Trudeau government told Canadians the cost of getting this unnecessary firearms buyback program up and running would be $8.8 .8 million. Last fall, I put a written question on the order paper asking for more information about this program. An answer was provided on Wednesday. This time I only had to wait six months to get an answer instead of three years. 
getting better. The response says the Trudeau <laughs> government has already spent $41.9 .9 million on this program. Not worth the cost, Leader. This is a boondoggle, and it hasn't even begun. Leader, how can your government have spent $42 million on this? How many firearms have they bought back? Senator Gold. Uh, thank you for your question. You know, it is, uh, it is hard to put a price on the value of a life. <clears throat> but every gun that is not in circulation, that cannot be used to create and to cause injury to individuals or their families, uh, it is worth uh, the investment. And in that regard, the government of Canada's firearm legislation and series of bills that we in the Senate have passed, admittedly over the objection of some members, uh, are designed to keep and make Canada and Canadians safer. And in that regard, uh, it is worth the cost and this government will continue to do what it can uh, to protect Canadians from the scourge of gun violence. Senator Platt. Well, I clearly read into that uh, that my answer is zero. Yeah. <laughs> In December of 2020, the Trudeau government hired, what else? Consultants to provide advice on how to run this boondoggle. Canadians know? were told IBM's contract was worth $1.2 million. This, the answer is, it is worth over 2.2 million is in fact what they've spent on them. Leader, do you commit to tabling a full breakdown of the $42 million in the Senate chamber so Canadians can see exactly how their tax dollars are spent? Senator Gold. <clears throat> well, thank you for your question. Uh, first of all, you should not assume that my answer uh, was zero. Uh, uh, um, but if I may continue, uh, honorable colleague, uh, once again, the investments that Canada has made and will continue to make both in the design and the implementation of the buyback program and all other measures uh, associated with its program to reduce the scourge of, of gun violence uh, are uh, justified and in the best interest of Canadians. Senator Carignan. Merci. Thank you very much. My question is for the leader. Mr. Leader, this week you told me that Minister Lametti used the opinion of two retired judges in order to talk about a new process, but you refuse to tell us what those two opinions were. However, three different courts had found him guilty with complete evidence. Can you tell us what the names of the judges are when did they provide this opinion to the minister and in what form? By what process or criteria were these retired judges chosen by the minister to provide this opinion? Senator Gold, thank you for the question, colleague. You know the rules surrounding legal opinions asked for by the government. They are protected and for good reasons and for good governance. That said, the decision is the Justice, Justice Minister's prerogative as well as the Attorney General's. Uh, I mentioned a few days ago, if not yesterday or perhaps a few days ago, that according to the information that I have, Minister Farani does not intend to disclose anything regarding those legal opinions. Senator Carignan. You're correct, Mr. Leader. I understand the rules. And the opinion belongs to the government. And it's the government that can decide to raise the confidence and should do so. That's why, well, Patrick Michel, of the, the Director of Criminal and Penal Prosecutions stated that this was an issue. Would you agree that your government's lack of transparency contributes to this perception? Senator Gould, I will respond and simply say no. I do not agree. Senator Gould, 
It appears that in spite of federal government's investment in rebuilding Canada's pharmaceutical industry following COVID-19, drug companies in this country actually spent less on in-house research in Canada in 2022 than they did the year before. This deinvestment is part of a pattern that this industry has established in Canada, abandon in-house fundamental research, mind the work of Canadian scientists, and charge high drug prices to Canadians. Can you please tell us what the government is doing to counter this pattern? Senator Gold. Thank you for your question, Senator. The government remains firmly committed to supporting cutting-edge technologies and approaches to uh, accelerate drug recovery, to develop new drugs and treatments for the benefit of Canadians. And one example of this is the uh, investment that the government has made, an investment of $49 million through the Strategic Innovation Fund for the creation of the Conscience Open Science Drug Discovery Network. This is a collaborative pan-Canadian network which aims to address gaps in the development of potential drugs and therapeutics, particularly in the areas of tradition in this uh, direction. Senator Kutcher. Senator Gold, could you please ask the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry to provide us in this chamber with a written answer that details the strategy, the evaluation and responsibility framework that his department has developed to ensure ongoing robust pharmaceutical industry investment in fundamental research. Not the network, but the pharmaceutical company investment, please. Senator Gold. Well, Senator, thank, thank you for the question, although if I, with respectfully, I think it might have been more appropriate to have submitted this as a written question. Uh, that said, I will bring this to the attention of the Minister, and I would be happy to facilitate a discussion uh, between you and the Minister on this subject. Senator Omidvar. Thank you, Speaker. Senator Gold, my question is about Gaza. It's been over two months since the government in initiated a new temporary visa for Canadian citizens and permanent residents to secure visas for their families in Gaza. Uh, as of Monday, IRCC has informed us that only 14 individuals have successfully completed the application and have been subsequently approved for entry into Canada, just 14. This is at a time when Gaza is facing imminent fash, uh, famine. Can you please outline why the uptake and the approval has been so minimal? Senator Gold. <clears throat> well, thank you for your question, Senator. Uh, while movement out of Gaza remains uh, very unpredictable, Canada continues to work with its partners on the ground to facilitate the safe exit of Canadians. Uh, and of permanent residents and of course and of their family members. The challenge remains, colleagues, as we all know, um, that Canada does simply not determine who, when or how many individuals can cross the Gaza Strip uh, and cross RAFA. The, and this is a challenge and the government will continue uh, to work on every level to make every effort to make sure that extended family members and others that qualify uh, are able to leave Gaza. Senator Omidvar. Thank you, Senator Gold, for that answer. But those individuals who do leave Gaza and find their way to some safety in Egypt are then informed by IRCC officials that the application form must be completed in Gaza. I, I, so here they are, they've fled to some safety. They're being told, no, 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 go back to Gaza, complete your application to meet the criteria. I, do you understand this? I don't. Senator Gold. Well, no, this is a challenge, and thank you for, for raising it. This is my understanding. Uh, IRCC is unable to collect biometrics at the application stage. So what they've done is implemented, uh, this is my understanding, a multi-stage uh, process to collect enhanced biographic information both while applicants are still in, in Gaza, which was what they did, as you recall, with regard to Afghanistan. But then this allows IRCC to initiate the security screening process, screening process and it's followed by biometric collection and screening in Egypt. And in that regard, IRC is doing what it can uh, to uh, uh, eliminate this obstacle. Merci, Senator Gold. Uh, Thank you, Senator Gold. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Uh, my question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The number of Canadians with HIV is on the rise. My province 
of Manitoba has almost three times the new diagnosis rate, and Saskatchewan has four times the new diagnosis rate compared to the national average. Self-testing for HIV meets people where they are and provides a safe way for people to get tested. Yet federal funding for HIV self-testing kits will run out at the end of this month in March 2024. Mm -hmm. Senator Gold, the government has stated it wants to end HIV as a public health concern by 2030. What is the plan to improve access to HIV mm -hmm. testing? Senator Gold. Thank you for your question, uh, Senator. Uh, it's an important one. My understanding is that public, uh, health, the Public Health Agency of Canada is continuing to explore options to make HIV self-test kits available to community-based organizations after March 31st of this year. And the uh, Public Health Agency of Canada will continue to work closely with CATI, that's the Canadian AIDS Treatment Information Exchange, uh, which is an online uh, HIV resource uh, that can connect individuals to counseling and other HIV services as well, and to the, your point, to help find testing sites and HIV organizations. Senator Osler. Thank you, Senator Gold. Discrimination against and stigmatization of people living with HIV remain significant barriers to accessing prevention, treatment, and support. More than 16,000 Canadians diagnosed with HIV are not actively engaged or represented in the HIV care continuum. Individuals need to access care without fear of judgment or discrimination. Senator Gould, what is the government's plan to raise national awareness, correct misconceptions, and reduce the ongoing stigma surrounding HIV? Senator Gould. Well, thank you for raising this important point. Uh, it, it recalls... Uh, in another life, when I was, uh, I worked with a group from the Canadian Bar Association to author the first report on the legal implications of AIDS, and this goes back to 1986. So I date myself in my answer. Uh, but the government of Canada, in addition to the investments that it's making to support those uh, uh, living with <coughs> HIV, uh, will continue to do its part to communicate the importance of treating all Canadians, regardless of their medical situation or circumstances. Merci, Senator Gold. Thank you, Senator Gold. Senator Gold, I was pleased to see the announcement of the $100 million participation agreement with the, between the First Nations Bank of Canada and the Canadian Infrastructure Bank announced earlier this month. I look forward to the First Nations Bank of Canada playing a managing role in the distribution of funds for infrastructure projects within Indigenous communities. Can you elaborate on how this particular project aims to address infrastructure challenges within Indigenous communities and what specific types of projects will benefit from this funding? Senator Gold. <clears throat> Thank you for your, very, uh, for your question, Senator. My understanding is that the uh, agreement um, uh, will provide for a broad and long list of infrastructure programs uh, to uh, be uh, funded. And this would in, uh, range from or include everything from broadband projects roads, energy infrastructure, uh, to water and wastewater management, as well as housing, commercial, and industrial developments. This is very, very important work that First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities will, uh, uh, will, uh, will benefit from because they'll be able to get loans more quickly and more easily. Senator Klein. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. Supplemental question, uh, Senator Gold. The CEO of the First Nations Bank of Canada, Mr. Bill Lomax, uh, suggested in a CTV article that this agreement will provide accessible financing for projects ranging from large-scale developments to smaller initiatives, as you just outlined. Could you provide us with some assurances that this fund will indeed just do that? Senator Gold? Right. Well, thank you for my question, uh, your question. <laughs> um, um, I'd like to be able to ask questions from time to time, wouldn't it? Um, but it is my understanding that both the uh, Can Canadian Infrastructure Bank and the First Nations Bank have indeed stated that the agreement will cover both large-scale and smaller-scale infrastructure initiatives. It is important to note, however, that to, to a considerable degree, these infrastructure projects tend to be larger in scope, but it does cover all sizes of projects. Senator Platt. Government leader in December, the Trudeau government actually paid marksmen from the United States and New Zealand to fly around in helicopters to shoot invasive deer on Sydney Island, British Columbia. 
Parks Canada says the cost to Canadian taxpayers for this was $834,000. They confirmed 84 deer were culled, which works out to about $10,000 a deer. Even worse, oh the Trudeau government permitted these foreign hunters to use restricted AR-15 rifles equipped with prohibited silencers and prohibited 30-round magazines, all while they're taking firearms away from Canadian hunters. Leader, why did the Jagmeet Singh, Justin Trudeau government think this was a good idea? Senator Gold. <clears throat> Well, thank you for your question. Uh, I don't know, do not have the information that uh, uh, underlying the need uh, to uh, uh, engage in this uh, culling of deers. Um, I am going to make an assumption, and what I rarely make assumptions in this place, but I am going to make the assumption that it was based upon uh, proper and appropriate input uh, from the authorities, whether provincial, territorial, or federal on the, on the ground. And, and in, in that regard, I will certainly raise your concerns about the cost and other matters uh, with the relevant minister. Senator Platt. There is no justification for this leader, none. They will never fix the budget and they have no common sense. To top it all off, Parks Canada also confirmed that 20% of the deer culled by the foreign hunters were the wrong species of deer. Oh the Prime Minister proves time and time again that he is not worth the cost, doesn't he, Leader? Yes. Well, Senator uh, Gold? No, uh, I think the answer to that question is no, but, uh, but I congratulate you, uh, honorable colleague, on managing to get three or four of your catchphrases in in, in a very brief uh, question. Senator Martin. Well, you mentioned proper input, and the question is why were the local um, residents, BC hunters, not consulted on this? So my question also concerns the invasive deer call in December. I strongly suspect if given the chance, local BC hunters would have gladly paid for tags or permits to here, participate here. in Nothing. this call. Instead of having Canadian taxpayers cost um, bear the cost of $834,000. This could have provided food for their families, they, and they wouldn't have fired semi-automatic rifles from a helicopter while doing so. So I also suspect local hunters would have shot the correct species uh, of deer. <laughs> so, Leader, if the government was intent on going ahead with this, why weren't local BC hunters not asked to participate? Absolutely. Senator Gold. <clears throat> Well, thank you for your question. I mean, it's a fair question. I certainly will add that to uh, the question that I will address to the minister. Senator Martin. Leader, Parks Canada has said that the second phase of the call will take place between this coming fall and the spring of 2025. Given the waste of money and the other, utter lack of common sense displayed so far, is the Trudeau government considering any changes to the phase, the next phase of its deer call on Sydney Island? Senator Gold. Thank you. Once again, uh, I now have a, an even longer list of questions that I will address to the minister, and I undertake to do so. Sen Senator Usakos. Senator Gold, on the April 1st, your government plans to uh, increase again the carbon tax, a carbon tax that has contributed absolutely nothing in hitting your environmental targets. It has contributed in creating inflation, historic high costs of living that is pummeling young Canadians who are up here in the gallery. We're having a hard time buying homes. It has created record number of Canadians lining up in food banks. When is your government going to stop being ideological about this and understand that this thing isn't working? And when will your government, once and for all, spike the hike, axe the tax, and put an end to this April Fool's joke? Here, here. Senator well, Gold. You know, uh, in my tradition, we, have a, 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 we are accused of answering questions with questions. I will answer your question, the government, and then I will uh, pose one of my own. The government has no intention uh, of, of uh, retreating on, its, uh, on, the, on putting a price on pollution, which is the most market-sensitive, effective measure uh, to address the existential climate challenge that we and our planet is facing. But my question to you is, when will the opposition stop misleading Canadians? It is clear by third-party validators that the price on pollution has a negligible impact on the price of food, a negligible impact on inflation, and it is not in any sense contributing to the real problems that many Canadians are indeed facing. And properly so, but it, it, is, it is wrong 
And it is regrettable to instrumentalize the suffering of Canadians who are struggling to put food on their table by misleading them with regard to the impacts of the, of the price on pollution, which, the, which independent, non-government... Merci. Merci, Senator Gold. Thank you, Senator Gold. Senator Gold, what's regrettable is that this government is pummeling Canadians, young Canadians, this carbon tax is creating inflation. That's the only thing that has come out of this. And you haven't hit not a single time any of your environmental targets. Right. That's the reality. So even Jean Chrétien, Prime Minister Chrétien always said, any good prime minister will acknowledge when it's time to change and something isn't working. Change your mind and understand that this isn't working. So I'll ask a simple question for you. Ever since you've implemented this carbon tax, how much revenue has your government collected off this carbon tax? Tell Canadians how much, how negligible it is. Gold. Well, one of the things that uh, is important for Canadians to know, and I've said it on many different occasions, is that most of the revenue that has been collected by the carbon tax is returned to Canadians. It's returned to Canadians. Well, a family of four in Alberta will receive, on average, about $1,800 a year. A family of four in Manitoba it will receive approximately $1,200 a, a year. And that range, and a family in Newfoundland and Rabbit, Rabbit are close to $1,200. That's where the money's going back into the pockets of Canadians. Senator Platt. Leader, on March 30th of 2021, I put a written question on the Senate order paper asking how many middle class jobs were created in Canada by this inept Trudeau government giving the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank a quarter of a billion dollars. It remains unanswered on our order paper. My office submitted an access to information request to the finance department seeking any documents they produced in relation to my order paper question. A response was recently provided. It appears work was done on an answer, but it has all been redacted or withheld. Leader, it's been almost three years. Why is this Trudeau government still hiding the answer? Senator Gold. Well, colleagues, uh, thank you for your question. And again, uh, I will say on many, many occasions, uh, our office does everything that it can do to provide, uh, to transmit requests for information and to encourage the information to be provided in a timely fashion. Although I am gratified with the recent tabling of uh, many dozens of, of answers, it is still a, an unacceptable situation that senators should have to wait so long. And that is why that this government uh, supports, as I have said publicly in this chamber and before our rules committee, supports uh, a, a change to the rules of the Senate to bring us more in line, more in line uh, with what uh, uh, the practice and rules in the House of Commons to ensure, to, to ensure, to ensure that when senators pose their questions, their legitimate questions, to the government, they get an answer in a timely fashion. And that, I will continue to push forward for that. Senator Platt. Well, we all know why I haven't gotten the answer. The Trudeau government sent $250 million to a bank controlled by Beijing's Communist Party. They got nothing in return. They don't want to admit it in writing. The access to information response shows that in 2021, the finance department was instructed to answer my question within a reasonable time. Is three years reasonable, leader? Canadians deserve better. Senator Gold. Three years is not a reasonable time, Senator. As a, as a, you know, I, I, I stand here to answer as best as I can and, and as transparently as I can. And when I disagree with either the premises of your questions or indeed even the assertions that you make, I'm not shy to say so. But when I do agree with a situation that is not appropriate, uh, respectful of the Senate, I also stand here. You'll recall, Senators, though, though I represent the Senate in the government, I also represent the government to the Senate. Uh, uh, sorry, the Senate to the government, uh, and I'm doing. And in that regard, I will continue to to uh, to push for timely responses to your question. Senator Platt. Leader, this past July, a reporter asked Minister Freeland about the impact of the Prime Minister's carbon tax on residents in Prince Edward Island. She responded by saying, in part, I quote, "I don't actually own a car because I live in downtown Toronto." I'm like, I don't know, 300 meters from the nearest subway. I walk, I take the subway. When it was later pointed out to Minister Freeland that she has a taxpayer-funded car driven in the GTA, 
she said this was, quote, peddling blatant misinformation. Documents released in January show the minister billed taxpayers around $10,000 for limos and taxis in the GTA. Leader, are her expense claims misinformation? Senator Gold. Well, again, uh, Senator, thank you for your question. I think there's clearly a difference, if I may uh, state the obvious, and your question revealed that, uh, between whether or not uh, there is a, 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 a minister's car available for her in Toronto or whether or not uh, she is uh, claimed, uh, as we all do, uh, le le legitimate expenses associated with uh, parliamentary work. Uh, fact remains uh, to, to uh, that the price on pollution uh, has a differential impact uh, on individuals depending on where they live and, and depending on where they, whether they have access to public transportation. Those of us who live, uh, or those of us who live in big cities uh, have an easier time avoiding using cars than those in more rural areas or in smaller communities. But again, the price of pollution does provide important rebates to everyone who lives in a province like PEI that has not decided to put a carbon pricing regime in place. Dr. Plett. Well, it was reported in January that Minister Freeland billed just over $3,000 for limos and taxi rides and $6,736 for separate trips by her official chauffeur. Leader, isn't it hypocritical for the minister to lecture Canadians who cannot afford to pay for gas and who will pay even more in carbon tax as of April 1st when she spends thousands of their hard-earned dollars on limos and taxis? Senator Gold. <clears throat> it is not uh, hypocritical for the minister of finance or any minister, any parliamentarian uh, to do their work and it is not inappropriate uh, that legitimate expenses associated with our work uh, be compensated and be uh, covered uh, uh, by, the, uh, uh, by our budgets and the, and the taxpayers. The fact remains, colleagues, that the price on pollution is the, uh, an appropriate measure and one that has rebates built into it to mitigate the impacts on individual Canadians. Senator Platt. Leader, it turns out three affordability cabinet retreats taken by the Prime Minister Trudeau and his ministers cost taxpayers a lot more than originally thought. The National Post reported the three-day cabinet retreat in Vancouver in September of 2022 cost $471,000. Documents provided to Canadian Taxpayers Federation through access to information show another three-day Trudeau cabinet retreat in Hamilton in 2023 cost $305,000. A three-day affordability retreat in Prince Edward Island in August 2023 cost at least $485,000. This adds up to over $1.3 million. And all the expenses haven't been disclosed yet. How is this affordability leader? Is this worth the cost? Senator Gold. Uh, thank you for your question. The measures that the government has put into place to assist ca Canadians are working. They are helping, we are building, the, 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 the Canada is building more homes thanks to programs that designed uh, to create incentives and to streamline processes for the construction of the much needed rent, uh, 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 homes and rental accommodations that Canadians uh, seek. The measures that ca Canada has put into place uh, to assist uh, with uh, uh, other aspects of the cost of living, ranging from the very important measures to provide affordable daycare so that working parents uh, can uh, be free to work and know that their children are being well taken care of, uh, first steps towards a, a pharma care program to provide uh, 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 free contraceptives and so on. These are measures that the government has taken uh, that are discussed at such uh, retreats and they are the, to the benefit of all Canadians. Senator Platt. A million dollars would have built at least four homes in many parts of our country if we weren't talking about building homes. Senator Gold, last month I asked how much Prime Minister Trudeau and his cabinet spent on their most recent affordability retreat in Montreal. What did you find out, leader? Last month I asked you this, what did you find out? Or do we have to force 
through some other mechanism to get the answer. How much did the Trudeau cabinet spend on their fourth affordability retreat while Canadians used food banks in record numbers and searched dumpsters for food? Senator Gold. Well, again, uh, thank you, uh, Senator. I don't have the uh, answer to you with regard to the most recent uh, cabinet meetings in Montreal, which I had the privilege of, of attending. Uh, but once again, at these meetings, this is where the government uh, as uh, 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 takes the time to hear from experts, to hear from stakeholders, and to discuss amongst themselves uh, how to best move forward to assist Canadians uh, who are continue to be challenged uh, and continue to need the support and the help that the government does provide. The time for the period of questions. The time for question period is up. Good afternoon and uh, welcome colleagues, invited guests, members of the general public who are following today's proceedings of the Standing Senate Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs. Today we continue our consideration of Bill C-16, an act to amend the Canadian Human Rights Act and the Criminal Code, uh, with uh, this our last day of hearings on the bill. Uh, we will move to... Clause sorry, clause I screwed up the audio. Tomorrow. I do that all the time. Sorry, sorry, with sorry. Us today for the first hour are Jordan B. Peterson, Professor of Psychology Department of the University of uh, Toronto, and from the D. Jared Brown Professional Corporation, uh, D. Jared Brown, Lead Counsel. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Uh, you both have up to five minutes for uh, opening uh, statements, and Mr. Peterson, I believe you're going to lead off, Professor. The floor is yours. So, I think the first thing I'd like to bring up is that it's not obvious when considering a matter of this sort what level of analysis is appropriate. If you're reading any given document, you can look at the words or the phrases or the sentences or the complete document, or you can look at the broader context within which it is likely to be interpreted. And when I first encountered Bill C-16 and its surrounding policies, it seemed to me that the appropriate level of analysis was to look at the context of interpretation surrounding the bill which is what I did when I went and uh, scoured the Ontario Human Rights Commission web pages and examined its policies. I did that because at that point the Department of Justice had clearly indicated on their website in a link that was later taken down that Bill C-16 would be interpreted in w within the uh, precedents, uh, policy precedents already established by the Ontario Human Rights Commission. So when I looked on the website I thought, well, there's broader issues at stake here and I tried to outline some of those broader issues in the initial, you may or may not know, I made some videos criticizing Bill C-16 and, and a number of, its, uh, of the policies that surrounding it. And I think the most egregious elements of the policies are that it requires compelled speech. The, uh, the Ontario Human Rights Commission explicitly states that refusing to refer to a person by their self-identified name and proper personal pronoun, which is the pronouns that I was objecting to, uh, can, be, can be interpreted as harassment. And so that's, an exp that's explicitly defined in the relevant policies. Um, so I think that's appalling, first of all, because there hasn't been a piece of legislation that requires Canadians to utter a particular form of address that has particular ideological implications before, and I think that it's a line that we shouldn't cross. Um, then I think that the, the definition of identity that's enshrined in the surrounding policies is um, ill-defined and poorly thought through and also incorrect. Um, it's incorrect in that identity is not and will never be something that people define subjectively because your identity is something that you actually have to act out in the world as a set of procedural tools which most people learn and I'm being technical about this between the ages of two and four. It's a fundamental human reality. It's well recognized by the relevant say developmental psychological authorities. And so the idea that identity is something that you define purely subjectively is an idea without status as far as I'm concerned. I also think it's unbelievably dangerous for us to move towards 
uh, representing a social constructionist view of identity in our legal system. The social constructionist view insists that human identity is nothing but a consequence of socialization, which is, which, and, and there's an in, inordinate amount of scientific evidence suggesting that that happens to not be the case. And so the reason that this is being instantiated into law um, is because the people who are promoting that sort of perspective, or at least in part because the people who are promoting that sort of perspective know perfectly well that they've lost the battle completely on scientific grounds. It's implicit in the policies of the Ontario Human Rights Commission that sexual uh, identity, uh, biological sex, gender identity, gender expression, um, sexual proclivity, all vary independently, and that's simply not the case. It's not the case scientifically, it's not the case factually, and it's certainly not something that should be increasingly taught to people in high schools, elementary schools, and junior high schools, which it is, and it is being taught. I included this uh, cartoon character that I find particularly reprehensible, aimed obviously at it as it is at children somewhere around the age of seven, that contains within it the implicit, con the implicit claims as a consequence of its graphic mode of expression, that these elements of identity are first canonical and second independent, and neither of those happen to be the case. I think that uh, the inclusion of gender expression in the bill is something extraordinarily peculiar, given that gender expression is not a group, and that according to the Ontario Human Rights Commission, it deals with things as mundane as how behavior and outward appearance such as dress, hair, makeup, body language, and voice, which now, as far as I can tell, uh, open people to charges of hate crime under Bill C-16 if they dare to criticize the manner of someone's dress, which seems to me to be an entirely voluntary issue. So um, I think that the Ontario Human Rights Commission's uh, attitude towards vicarious liability is designed specifically to be punitive in that it makes employers responsible for um, harassment or discrimination, including the failure to use uh, preferred, preferred pronouns. They have vicarious liability for that, whether or not they know it's happening, whether or not the harassment was, and whether or not the harassment was intended or unintended. Right. And so I'll stop with that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brown. I'm a litigator in Toronto. I act in all manner of commercial and employment disputes. I'm not an academic. I live with my clients in the land of legal reality and how the law actually works. About two years ago, I began to see claims of discrimination included in every employment-related court claim. My phone now rings weekly with human rights tribunal matters. It has become a reality for employers across Canada. In August of last year, I became aware of Dr. Jordan Peterson. He was discussing what he saw as a problematic law, poorly written. That's when I observed the oddest thing happening. Lawyers, academic lawyers, important people began to say that he had the legal stuff wrong. Nothing unusual about this bill. And they also said, you don't get to go to jail if you breach a human rights tribunal order. What was happening is they weren't defending the law, but downplaying its effects. Now as a practicing lawyer, Anytime a lawyer, and particularly an academic, says, look away, there's nothing to see here, it gets my antenna way up. So I did some research, which can be found in the brief that I filed in advance of today. It sets out the path to prison on this. I knew as a commercial litigator that anyone can end up in jail if you breach a tribunal order. It is a simple civil contempt of court process. People go to jail for this. But what about the freedom of expression issue? It's a foundational issue. We all know that Section 2B of the Charter sets out that everybody has the fundamental freedoms of thought, belief, opinion, and expression. And we all know that the government has successfully restricted freedom of expression over the years. But what if rather than restricting what you can't say, the government actually mandated what you must say? In other words, instead of legislating that you cannot defame someone, for instance, the government says when you speak about a particular subject, let's say gender, you must use this government-approved set of words and theories. The American jurisprudence clearly defines this as unconstitutional compelled speech. In Canada, the Supreme Court has enunciated the principle that anything that forces someone to express opinions that are not their own is a penalty that is totalitarian and as such alien to the tradition of free nations like Canada. Now how does C-16 get us to compelled speech? The Minister of Justice has summarized Bill C-16 as the enactment amends the Canadian Human Rights Act 
to add gender identity and gender expression to the list of prohibited grounds of discrimination. The Department of Justice website used to say that we must look to the Ontario Human Rights Commission policies for definitions on these terms. Ontario's policies on gender identity and gender expression are set out in my brief. They state that gender-based harassment can involve refusing to refer to a person by their self-identified name and proper personal pronoun. Refusing to refer to a trans person by their chosen name and a personal pronoun that matches their gender identity will likely be discrimination. The law is otherwise unsettled as to whether someone can insist on any one gender-neutral pronoun in particular. If the harasser didn't know or didn't intend to harass, it's still harassment. Now why is this important? Well, in Ontario, the Human Rights Commission is a policy development creature of the legislature. It creates the policies which interpret the code. But what is most important, the tribunal must follow these policies. It is bound by them. So the Commission creates the law on pronouns. In Ontario, the policies on pronouns were introduced into the legal framework after the law had left the legislature. Federally, the same process will be followed as the Department of Justice had said so. A similar guideline will be developed. As with the Ontario policies, federal guidelines must be followed by the federal tribunal. The guidelines will mandate pronouns. This will happen after the bill leaves the Senate. Mandating use of pronouns requires one to use words that are not their own, which imply a belief in or an agreement with a certain theory on gender. If you try to disavow that theory, you can be brought before the Human Rights Commission for misgendering or potentially find yourself guilty of a hate crime. To sum up, on the subject of gender, we're going to have government-mandated speech. Now, in opining on the constitutionality of the proposed bill, the Department of Justice said on its website, look, there's a variation of this bill that already exists in most of the provinces. I don't believe that's a robust argument in favour of constitutionality. I would refer you to the comments of the now Chief Justice McLaughlin of the Supreme Court in the decision of Taylor. It's in my brief. The chilling effect of leaving overbroad provisions on the books cannot be ignored, while the chilling effect of human rights legislation is likely to be less significant than that of a criminal prohibition, the vagueness of the law means it may well deter more conduct than can legitimately be targeted. As a lawyer on the ground, I worry about poorly drafted, a poorly drafted law and its impact on my clients. As a Canadian, I worry about Parliament tacitly authorizing compelled speech. The brief I provided to the committee contains a comprehensive legal opinion that I published back in December on C-16. There's a table that shows how the federal human rights regime mirrors the Ontario system in terms of enforcement of policies and guidelines. I have to wrap up, sir. And finally, it includes the case law that underpins the opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, both. And we'll begin uh, questions beginning with uh, Deputy Chair Senator Baker. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to the witnesses for their uh, presentation. Um, as the witnesses know, the nine provinces in Canada uh, have uh, uh, the, um, the provision in their laws, uh, including Ontario, uh, and also the words expression, as I recall, appears in four or five provinces. Um, so what you are arguing is against what we already have in law, your reference to the criminality, the, to the sections of the criminal code. At our last meeting, Senator Joyal correctly pointed out uh, that sections 318 and 319 starts off by genocide, under the heading genocide. The next heading is uh, public incitement likely to lead to a breach of the peace, and you know what a breach of the peace is, Mr. Brown. Willful promotion of hatred. These things are, and then there are defenses listed, as you know, in that criminal code provision. There's several defenses. If you honestly believe in what you said, is if, if you, you know, the, the defenses are extensive in the criminal code. They've worked well for Canada. So, what do you have to say about the facts of what's hey, Dr. presently Kenner, in the what's criminal up? code? Um, I learned your trick. And I'm your using. reflection that somehow, how are you today? Uh, the genocide heading, the heading on public incitement, on willful promotion of hatred, somehow that these provisions should not be included under those headings. 
I think I have to be clear. My presentation relates to the amendments of the Human Rights Code or the and proposed not to amendment. The criminal code? And that is, in fact, how uh, one like Dr. Peterson may, in fact, find themselves on the wrong side of jail. And so, if you've if you've reviewed the uh, the publication and the opinion, I say that uh, simply by breaching the uh, the proposed amendment to the uh, to the Human Rights Act, um, and particularly with somebody who is deliberately doing so. For instance, somebody who is saying, I'm not going to use those words. That person, if they are dragged before the tribunal. The Ontario Dr Tribunal. Or the federal tribunal. Mm -hmm. I've indicated to you already that the Department yeah. of Justice yeah. has said yeah. they're going to pass the same guideline on pronouns. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm suggesting to you is that if somebody says, I'm not going to use those words, are brought before the tribunal, the federal tribunal, and the tribunal then delivers uh, an order, for a payment of a fine, and alternatively, mm -hmm. a non-monetary remedy, i.e. cease and desist order, mm -hmm. uh, a, an order to do something, to compel them to do mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And that person who's brought before the tribunal says, I'm not doing that. They will find themselves in contempt of court, and prison is the likely uh, uh, outcome of that process until they purge the contempt. That's what I'm suggesting. I'm not suggesting to you that, uh, that the uh, amendments to the criminal code um, well, I'm, I'm not advocating genocide, I guess let's just say that. And my, my presentation here is, is restricted to what I see as the pronoun policy issue and the compelled speech issue. So it covers the provincial legislation that you dis strongly disagree with that we've had in place in the provinces for decades in some cases. It is the policies that were enacted after it left the legislature and which will be enacted after this bill leaves this, uh, this committee. I would also like to add to that the fact that once I made the video stating that I wouldn't use the Z and Zer pronouns, for example, which I regard as part of an ideological linguistic vanguard, the university lawyers, after carefully considering what I said, sent me two letters to cease and desist in my public utterances because they believed that not only was I violating the university's standards of conduct, but that I was also violating the relevant provisions of the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Therefore, as far as I could tell, vindicating the statement that I made when I made the video to begin with, which was that the act of making the video itself was probably already illegal. And they didn't do that lightly. Under so, provincial law? Yes. Okay. Senator Platt. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, gentlemen, both of you, for being here. Uh, I have uh, two questions, one for Dr. Peterson. Uh, right at the get-go, and then one for the two of you. Uh, hopefully the chair will uh, indulge me. Uh, deliberations of this bill, and during deliberations of this bill, we keep hearing the term respect thrown around. Respect is indeed critical in debates of legislation as sensitive of, as this, and there are a lot of people here who need to be reminded that respect works both ways, including people at this committee. Uh, Dr. Baker, has, or uh, Senator Baker, has already referred to comments as genocide. I don't think anybody here is promoting genocide. However, Dr. Peterson, can you comment on the notion of respect where some of your critics say, why can you not just respect your students, just use the gender-neutral pronouns? How do you respond to that? Well, first of all, I'd have to be convinced that doing so would do more good than harm, and I don't believe that. And I, I think I'm actually in a reasonable position to, to, to justify my claim. I think that the danger that's intrinsic to the law far outweighs whatever potential benefit it might produce, especially given that there's no hard evidence whatsoever for any benefit. I, I would also like to point out that the people who are promoting this legislation claim to be acting on the behalf, behalf say, of the transgendered community, but they were not not elected nor appointed to act as such representatives and are doing it on their own say-so. I've received many letters, at least 30 now, from transgendered individuals indicating that the, they are not in accordance with the, the claims of these so-called representatives to be representing or with the intent of the legislation, which has actually made them more visible rather than less visible, which is, and the less visible is what they had preferred. With regards to respect is that you don't meet people, generally speaking, in a mutual display of respect. You generally meet people in a mutual display of alert neutrality, which is the appropriate way to begin an interaction with someone because respect is something that you earn as a consequence of reciprocal interactions with 
that are dependent on something like reputation, which is also a consequence of repeated interactions. And so the notion that addressing someone by their um, self-defined self-identity is necessarily an indication of basic human respect for them, I think is an entirely spurious argument, especially given that there's no evidence that moving the language in a compelled manner in this direction is going to have any beneficial effect. We're supposed to assume that just because hypothetically the intent is positive that the outcome will be positive and any social scientist worth his or her salt knows perfectly well that that's rarely the case. So, Dr. Brown, uh, you've talked about uh, non-monetary <coughs> orders uh, that could include sanctions like orders to undertake sensitivity and anti-bias training. I would like uh, either one or both of you to comment on uh, whether you could explain why an individual may have a strong objection to undertaking such a training. And Mr. Brown, could you let the committee know how serious the sanction could be? And of course, you already did on that uh, if you refuse to undertake such an order, uh, and specifically at the federal level. But what would, what would, why would people have an objection to taking such training? Well, I think I'm going to let Dr. Peterson answer why he or someone like him might have an, uh, an objection to undertaking that type of training, and then I'll deal obviously uh, once again with the severity of that decision if it gets before the tribunal. Well, I have a profound objection to, to undergoing such training. In fact, I would flatly refuse under all conditions to undergo it. And the reason, there's multiple reasons for that. The first reason is that the science surrounding the, uh, the, the, the so-called charge of implicit bias that's associated with perception is by no means settled in, 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 to such a degree that to one of the three people who designed the most commonly used measure, which is the implicit association test, has detached himself from the other two uh, researchers on the grounds that the use of the test has become has far transcended its scientific validity and reliability. It's nowhere near valid or reliable enough to be used in the manner that it's been using. And even the more uh, pro-IAT researchers who developed the test have admitted to that publicly, even though they haven't stressed it nearly to the degree they should have. So first of all, the science is, is not settled and is being used absolutely inappropriately. And I can say that as a clinician because I know the, and as a psychometrician, I know the criteria for using a test for essentially diagnostic purposes and the IAT doesn't even come close to what's necessary. And then the next issue is, well, where's the evidence that, that anti-unconscious bias training works? There's no evidence and what little evidence there is suggests that it actually has the opposite effect because people don't like being brought in front of a re-education committee and having their fundamental perceptions, you see, their perceptions, not even their thoughts, but their perceptions themselves, altered by collective fiat. It's an unbelievable... You there, sir. <coughs> we have a very engaged committee, concise questions and concise responses with the helpful uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I want to quote uh, briefly from a, a document from the Ontario Human Rights Commission says some people may not know how to determine what pronoun to use. Others may feel uncomfortable using gender neutral pronouns. Generally, when in doubt, ask a person how they wish to be addressed. Use they if you don't know which pronoun to you is preferred. Simply referring to their person by their chosen name is always a respectful approach. So you can use a pronoun, you can choose, you can use their chosen name. So if someone chooses to change his name from Paul to Peter, Surely you would use Peter because it's a matter of simple politeness and, and respect. If the uh, same person's, person chooses to ch cho change her name from Paul to Paula, won't, won't, I won't use, you use the name Paula simply as a matter of respect. What's the difference well, well, here? Well, I guess the issue, at, and, and, and speak about the legal issue there, is that you're now introducing the full force of the law behind the requirement to use and I'm dealing obviously with, with respect to the pronoun issue. In terms of not addressing somebody by their by their legally registered name, for instance, um, uh, I don't think that's where we're running into trouble here. I think the issue becomes that if you don't you address somebody by the, uh, the pronoun that they self-identify by, as I've read out to you, the fact that the full force of the law will be behind uh, that person, um, that that's what I, I'm uh, finding is tro troubling in the legislation. But the Ontario Human Rights Commission gives Per people the alternative not to use pronouns and use the person's chosen name, which is always a respectful approach. So pronouns are not necessary, are not mandatory. You can always choose the person's chosen name as a respectful approach. 
And therefore, I argue. I, I'm not aware that anybody that there is a um, a piece of legislation that compels you to use my proper name. In other words, um, it, once again, it's the fact that the full force of the law will be behind it when we're dealing with the, the group being identified in the legislation. And so, for instance, if I were not to call you by your chosen name, I'm not sure you'd enjoy the full force of the law behind you uh, um, as a result of that. And that's what I'm suggesting to you is the difference here. I'm just arguing, sir, that you always base whatever you say on what the Ontario Human Rights Commission is saying. And I'm quoting from the Ontario Human Rights Commission document. They're saying we're not mandate, mandating pronouns. You can always use the person's chosen name as a respectful approach. I respectfully disagree. But then, well, I would say then that's actually an indication of just exactly how poorly the policy documents are written because I can quote this one, which, which is also from the Ontario Human Rights Commission website that says, and I quote, refu refusing to refer to a person by their self-identified name and proper personal, uh, proper personal pronoun counts, constitutes gender-based harassment. And so if, there, if the policies were written in a coherent manner and there wasn't internal contradictions, then your statement would be a reasonable objection. But since it's not written that way, and I do believe firmly that that's a testament to the, to the degree to which it's a poorly written set of policies, is that it's full of internal contradictions. And that'll be worked out very painfully within the confines of people's private lives. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Senator Batters. Thanks very much, both of you, for being here. Um, first of all, uh, Dr. Peterson, I want to go back to this issue of personal pronouns, and if you could please tell our committee more about this issue. It's something that I was not at all familiar with prior to this bill um, um, being introduced, and in particular about the gender-neutral pronouns and your experience in pushing back against being forced to use those gender-neutral pro gender -neutral pronouns. Well, I don't think the people who initiated this legislation ever expected that there would be an absolute explosion of, of identities, first of all, and also of, of so-called personal pronouns, as there has been. I think Facebook now recognizes something like 71 separate gender identity categories, each of which in principle is associated with its own set of pronouns. And so it's become, well, linguistically, un it's, it's become a parody, essentially. It's become linguistically unmanageable. And it's also the case that words can't be introduced into the language by fiat. I don't, I, I can't even think of a time when that's actually worked. We're not exactly sure how words enter the common parlance, but it's certainly not that way. And so the, the, the legislation devolves into a kind of, of, of absurdity, as far as I can tell. I mean, one of the people that I discussed this with claimed that the way that you kept track of someone's personal pronouns was to use your cell phone as an adjunct to your communication. And I mean, that's, you wouldn't say anything like that if you knew anything about common human nature, let's say, and the manner in which people communicate with one another. Okay, so, so the types of pronouns you're talking about, just so everyone's clear, because I don't think these are com common parlance, um, Z and Zer and what other sorts of gender neutral pronouns are we discussing here? Well, I have a very bad memory for that sort of thing, but if you're interested in it, you can find lists of them very rapidly on the web, and, and they've been produced by, I think, they've been produced by people whose essential desire is to gain linguistic control. That's, that's, that's as simple as I can put it, is to gain linguistic control. But they're not used popularly. And, and that seems to me to be a, it, it's a real problem as a consequence that you make failure to make their use something that, that could carry a criminal penalty. So I just don't understand that. And, and I don't understand how the government can justify imposing a criminal penalty on the use of words that no one either knows or uses. It, it just seems preposterous to me, but okay. there it is. Could you please also tell us a little bit more about the, your personal experience in pushing back against this? And I mean, many are familiar with your story, but uh, not everyone, so I just want to give you a little well, bit Well, I made a video, actually I made three videos, but we'll just talk about one of them. I, I, I made one criticizing Bill C-16 for the reasons that I already described, because I went and read the policies, and I, they made my hair stand on end to the surrounding policies. And uh, so I made a video stating essentially that and detailed out my reasons. And, um, you know, I've been following the, the battle of, let's say, ideologies on campus for a very long period of time, and I, I suppose I have some expertise in that. And there's, a, there's an ideological war that's ripping the campuses apart, uh, and it's essentially between a 
of, of an ideological variant that's rooted in what's come to be known as postmodernism with kind of a neo-Marxist base and and modern modernism, I would say. And that, that's accounting for all the turmoil on the campuses, and I see this as an extension of this campus turmoil into the broader world, and, and I really believe that is the proper level of analysis. I truly believe that. And so I said that I believe that this is the, a vanguard issue in a kind of ideological war, and that I'm not going to participate on the side of the people whose, whose ideological stance I find reprehensible, unforgivable and reprehensible, especially the Marxist element of it. And so I announced that I wasn't going to use these words because I don't believe that they're instantiated to protect anyone's rights. I believe they're, that the, the, the ideologues who are pushing this movement are using unsuspecting and sometimes complicit members of the so-called transgender community to push their ideological vanguard forward. And I firmly believe that. So I'm not participating in that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's potentially illegal for me not to participate in that is something that I regard as, I think that's absolutely dreadful. It, it's, it, make, it puts a shudder in my heart as a Canadian that we could even possibly be in a situation like that. You know, if, if, the, if the identity claims that are instantiated in, this leg, in the policy surrounding this legislation are applied, it's going to be hell for the psychiatrists, excuse my language, it's going to be very difficult for the biologists and the psychiatrists next. And I think we'll see that happening very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Gold. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Um, uh, I, I've never been a practicing lawyer. Uh, I was a constitutional law professor, uh, and I'm a free speech guy. Um, so I appreciate the importance of the issues that are being raised. I, I think respectfully they were answered, the free speech issues were answered quite compellingly by my former colleague Brenda Cosman in testimony before this committee. But I, I wanted to make three points. Um, uh, Mr. Peterson, and, and there are questions sort of buried in these points. Um, you, I think I heard you say that you thought that the harm of, to this legislation outweighs the good, but, but, uh, but there is, the trans community suffers harm regularly when they're discriminated against. And whatever else one might say and worry about human rights tribunals and, and the like, this bill addresses and would take a major step forward towards reducing harm uh, that a particularly vulnerable community uh, um, experiences. Second, let's see if we can zero in on where we might agree that um, there is nothing in the law that criminalizes or creates a, an offense to criticize the notion that identity is a social construct, which you do to criticize the way in which words come into the language. The modern Hebrew is an example of words coming in by fiat, and the Académie Française does it as well. Of course, Shakespeare gave us so much of our language. But there's nothing in this bill that stands in the way of you taking a principled position against all aspects of this, including your criticisms of the activists. Um, the issue is the pronoun, and, and unless I'm reading it wrong, uh, as Senator Pratt pointed out, the Ontario Human Rights Commission policy does not say that refusing to use a, a person's self-identified name or personal pronoun does constitute gender-based harassment. I may, I may be wrong, but I believe it said it could. And I think that's a real difference. If, if I turn to you and say, look, please call me they, because that's how I see myself now, because it's hurtful for you to call me sir um, or miss, whatever, whatever it would be, uh, but you refuse. And I say, well, okay, if you're uncomfortable with that because you're not comfortable with that, call me Mark, and you refuse. Were you to continue to call me by the name that I'm telling you is hurtful to me? Is that not, in fact, something that Is that not something that, that, that the law can properly address? This is, you are knowingly hurting me. Uh, and, and in that respect, um, our courts ultimately, I think, are capable of striking a proper balance between people who slip up or who, for whatever reasons, just can't get the words out of their mouth and those that 
persist in intentionally causing community to respond. Would you agree with my characterization of the of free speech as it applies to these issues? Let me jump in just on the legal point. It, uh, after Dr. Peterson posted his videos and after he rose to the public consciousness, um, the Ontario Human Rights Commission deemed it fit to release a new policy document called Questions and Answers about Gender Identity and Pronouns, and in so doing, they said that refusing to refer to a trans person by their chosen name and, per and a personal pronoun that matches their gender identity or purposely misgendering will likely be discrimination. So I think it's a little bit more certain than what you may have uh, uh, indicated in your comment, but I'll allow Dr. Um, uh, and once again, that, was th that policy was, was put out after um, Dr. Peterson um, began to speak on the issue, and so I think that's very telling that it was a, a, a response, if you will, to this this um, this issue that Dr. Peterson raised. I'm going to allow, obviously, Dr. Peterson to go ahead with the uh, other element of your question. Very briefly, sir. Well, so I, I would say that the very idea that calling someone uh, a term that they didn't choose causes them such irreparable harm that legal remedies should be sought. Um, rather than regarding it as a form of impoliteness, that legal remedies should, should be sought, including potential violation of the hate speech codes, is an indication of just how deeply the culture of victimization has sunk into our society. Okay, we'll, we'll leave it there, uh, Senator Frum. Um, same topic, uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, when uh, the Minister of Justice was before this committee, um, she said, the following there is nothing within bill c16 that would compel somebody to have to call somebody by the pronoun he or she or otherwise can you comment on her position i'd agree with that there is nothing in in the bill but the problem is that in the uh, the government of canada department of justice website um they uh, in their questions and answers section of that website which was pulled down in december it's at tab five of my brief. It, it makes very clear that the definitions of the terms gender identity and gender expression have already been given by the Ontario Human Rights Commission. The Commission has provided helpful discussion and examples that can offer good practical guidance. The Canadian Human Rights Commission will provide similar guidance on the meaning of these terms in the Canadian Human Rights Act. Now, I take that to be a state of legislative intent, and I'll agree with you that the, that the bill itself on its face does not seem to imply any manner of compelled speech, but when we're tying it so deliberately and with this expectation, that's where I think you get into uh, into some trouble. And Chair, may I ask one more? Um, again, Mr. Brown, you, you spoke about the chilling effects of overly broad legislation. I'm wondering if you consider the terms gender identity and gender expression to be equally broad, or do you consider one broader than the other? Um, it, I think they are overly broad definitions, and uh, and I think the only thing I can offer uh, as a lawyer and a litigator is that um, the courts don't like overbroad terms, and I, and I would refer you to the decision of, of uh, London Boisson of the Alberta Court of Appeal, where in that case the Court of Appeal says the objective of statutory interpretation is to, dis to discern the legislative intent from the language of the legislation, if possible, and to give effect to such intent. This objective becomes difficult to attain where there is conflict, imprecision, or a lack of clarity in the legislation. Of, particularly, of particular concern in the area of human rights law is that a lack of clarity will cast a chill on the exercise on the, of the fundamental freedoms such as freedom of expression and religion. And so, um, while I personally believe that the, that the terms are not properly or not clearly defined and, and somewhat ambiguous, the courts uh, don't like that type of legislation either. To add two things. Um, with regards to the chill, it's already the case, and I've seen this among my own students when they're teaching personality, which is what I teach, which also involves uh, assessment of gender differences between men and women, that the proclivity now is for the advanced PhD students to avoid any such discussions in their classrooms because the potential cost of transgressing against a, an unknown norm, let's say, is so high that it's just easier to teach other things. And so I've seen that clearly and with multiple people. And I would also say that it's no trivial matter that the Department of Justice's link to the Ontario Human Rights Commission and their statements about how this legislation was going to be interpreted mysteriously disappeared in the middle of December. Of all the things that have happened to me, uh, happened in relationship to this uh, that I've been studying, I think that was the most chilling. 
it's like because it was the it was the what would you say it was the smoking pistol right because the issue is what's the right level of analysis are you just supposed to look at the legislation well since the justice department said no you're supposed to look at the surrounding policies well that's what i did and that's what i based my case on and then all of a sudden the link to those the link tying those two things together just vanished and people had to go into the internet archives to 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 fish it back out so that it could remain part of the public record I think that's absolutely scandalous. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Senator Ahmedvar. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you both of you for being here. Um, I was trying to take notes, but I think I got this right, Mr. Peterson, that you talked about this bill as being an expression of the vanguard of ideology. Am I, am I right in thinking? In, in well, I was thinking more about the policies that surrounded it, but, but okay. yes. Yeah. So I'm trying to square what you, as a party of one, are saying with uh, published documents from the Canadian Psychological Association, the American Psychological Association, the M Canadian Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the Canadian Psychiatric Association, and the United Nations human rights uh, experts. So these are all, you know, these are not parties of one, they are associated, they are all, I imagine, lots of psychologists are members of the Canadian Psychology Association and the Canadian Psychiatry. So how are we to square what you're saying, which is your opinion, uh, which you are absolutely entitled to, with what everyone is saying, plus the feelings and testimonies of the people who have suffered uh, over 30 years, who've been taking issues to court, these are people who we've, who we've listened to. So how are we to square this? Okay, well, with regards to your second point, if the people that you're listening to aren't randomly selected from a population, then their opinions are worthless from the perspective of, of testimony because you don't know if you're dealing with a biased sample. And that's a big problem with the public consultation process that underlied this bill. And, and you can not appreciate that if you'd like, but it's standard practice in any in any polling institution or any body that's attempting to extract a genuine opinion out of a so-called community of people. And if that isn't followed, then you can't tell if the information that you're, pro that you're receiving is biased. And this, with regards to your first point, what exactly are all those people who aren't thinking the same way as me say? You said that there's a bunch of them and a bunch of groups, but you never said what they're saying precisely. Well, I'm, I think our chair would rule me out of 45 No, you're fine to read out what they're all saying, but in general, they say they oppose discrimination and harassment because of gender identity and gender expression. And then there's three pages, which I can share with you. I oppose discrimination against gender identity and gender expression. That's not the point. The point is the specifics of the legislation that surrounds it and the insistence that people will have to, be, have to use compelled speech. That's what I'm objecting to. I've dealt with all sorts of people in my life, very people who don't fit in in all sorts of different ways. I'm not a discriminatory person. There's 500 hours of my teaching to my classrooms on tape on YouTube and nobody's found a smoking pistol. I'm not a discriminatory individual, but I think this legislation is reprehensible and I do not believe for a moment that it will do what it intends to do. I also don't think that my opinion deviates substantially from the bodies that you're describing because you haven't provided any evidence that they say anything other than discrimination is a bad thing. And I think that unreasonable discrimination is a bad thing. And it's unreasonable when people are judged for any reason other than the specific competence that they bring to, say, a given position. It's not in anyone's best interest that that occurs. But I don't think that you've demonstrated in the least that the opinions that I'm putting forward are exist in opposition to the standard practices of, say, of my particular discipline. So... Could you... Re may I follow? Mm -hmm. Could you repeat one more time your response to Senators Gold and Pratt that the Ontario Human Rights Commission has provided what I would say reasonable alternatives uh, to your, your uh, objection to using pronouns? Well, I, th I think it's been made clear in the, in the presentation so far is that it depends on which part of the Ontario Human Rights Commission's policies you read. And that's a big problem. I mean, that's that, one of the reasons I criticized this to begin with was because when I went through the policies, I could see that they're absolutely incoherent. So, for example, here, let me give you another example. So there's an insistence in the Ontario Human Rights Commission that sexual preference is an immutable phenomenon. 
which indicates, at least in principle, that it's biologically grounded. But on the same, by the same token, in exactly the same policies, they presume that sexual identity, gender identity, and gender expression are entirely independent. It's like, sorry, guys, you can't have both of those because one's A and one's not A, and you can't put those together. And like, there's there's endless numbers of places in the policy uh, surround surrounding Bill C-16 that are characterized by that kind of logical incoherency. And I mean, what's it going to do to people who are transgender, who are making the claim that they were, say, born that way at birth, which is a strong claim. That's a biological claim. It indicates that there's a direct causal connection between some biological phenomena and the expression of a particular identity. It's actually the strongest defense that people who have, let's call them non-standard sexual identities or gender identities, have to defend okay. their claims. I have to wrap it up there and move on to uh, Senator Boisvenu. Merci beaucoup, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'll leave the time for our guests to uh, put in their translation devices. Thank you very much for being here. My question is for Mr. Peterson. Do you have the interpretation now, sir? So, I'm still trying to orient myself a little bit in this bill. I'm a little bit lost in the arguments in the f for and against, but some arguments really struck me because some people said that without this bill there might be suicides, people would become depressed, uh, transgender people of course. And it seems to me that this is almost an extreme position, that without this bill there would be an explosion of suicides and depression. So I'd like to ask you a question as a professor. Now you work in the, the, the social sciences, you study human behavior. Are there studies or statistics about the consequences that this bill would have on those people? Is this bill, would this bill save as many lives and help as many people as it says? Well, in, in principle, we would have that information if the policies that have already been introduced by the provincial governments were assessed properly. But as far as I know, there's been no, no studies indicating that the introduction of this legislation specifically has done anything to modify the, the unfortunate rates of, of suicide, depression, anxiety, and so forth that are that are characteristic, well, you could say often of marginalized groups, but that's a bit of an overstatement. So, no, I don't, that, that, that was part of my original claim, is that there's no evidence that this sort of um, legal redress, let's say, is going to produce any of the positive consequences that are intended. And I do believe that by making the issue, let's say, painfully visible, that's one way of thinking about it, that's actually had the opposite effect. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very common, and, and this is something that's, that's well known in, in the relevant social sciences, that just because you intend something to happen when you make a large-scale transformation doesn't indicate in any manner that that's going to be the outcome. I mean, it would be lovely if things were that simple. And I mean, the best social scientists always insist that you build an outcome analysis into any, in, into any broad-scale, what would you call, uh, uh, social intervention because there's a good chance it'll backfire. There's a high chance it'll backfire. So it's all presupposition. And it's, it's based at least in part on the notion that the transgender community is a community and that there are voices that speak for them homogeneously and that this is what they all want and that it will work as intended. And to me, looking at this from, from the social science perspective, it's, it's, there's nothing about it that's credible. Missy. And I also don't buy the intent, so. Okay, Senator Dupuy. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I'd like to ask a question to Mr. Peterson. And perhaps I would also have a question for uh, Mr. Brown. My question is as follows. Dr. Peterson, I'm trying to understand your position. Do you see a difference between the opinions that you express, that you are expressing today on this issue as part of this public consultation? And
And the actions that you take as a university professor, where you are in a position of authority and power over your students. Well, first of all, I don't necessarily consider myself in a position of authority and power. I consider myself in a position of responsibility. And those aren't the same thing. So I don't agree with the way that the, the question is formulated. And I don't understand what that has to do with my stance. I mean, if I believe that the legislation is going to do more harm than good, and I've, I also firmly believe, which I do, that it is more in the issue of an ideological move than, than, than something that's designed to address the concerns that it purports to address. I, I would also like to point out briefly that, you know, what should have happened when I made that video, and this is relevant to the question, was that, like, maybe people paid attention to, 10 minutes, to, to, to it for 10 minutes and maybe it got a newspaper article and then it disappeared. But I put my finger on something, that's what I thought, and the fact that this issue hasn't gone away in nine months, quite the contrary, it's exploded not only in Canada but in all sorts of parts of the world, means, that I means to me that I have some evidence that my choice of level of analysis was correct and that there's far more going on here, so to speak, than the mere surface issue that we're purporting to discuss. And so I take exception to the notion that I'm somehow abandoning my personal responsibility to my students, which is something that I believe is in fact driving what I'm doing. I believe that my obligation to my students constantly is to tell them what I think and to make that as informed and careful an opinion as I can possibly matter, ma master, and that's what I do. I think that you understand that if you come to participate or to appear before a Senate committee studying a bill, regardless of what we think of the question, that, I mean, my question for you is, do you make a difference between your opinion, what you say, and the fact that the university, which pays you, I believe, unless I'm wrong, the university considers you to be under its legal responsibility. And so you are in a situation of authority over your students. And this means that you can give an A or an F to your students. And the components of the legislation, I think uh, that's relevant. I'm, I'm going to move on. Uh, Senator McDonald. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Peterson, I have a question for you. Um, the thing that concerns me most in this legislation is compelled speech. I think that's very con concerning. Um, this committee has heard from Megan Murphy, who told us her opposition to this concept of gender fluidity, fluidity because she believes gender is a social construction. And Dr. Gad Saad also opposed to this legislation because of his belief in evolutionary biology. What this shows is that with Bill C-16, we are prematurely shutting down a discussion on gender and sex that is far from settled, or appears to be far from settled. Um, and in my opinion, when we look to the provincial definition set up by the commissions, we are enshrining the theory of a gender spectrum into the law. I wonder if you can comment on that. That's exactly what we're doing. We're in, and I think, I think that that might even be more dangerous than, in my opinion, than the compelled speech issue, because the social constructionist view of gender isn't another opinion, it's just wrong. So because, and I can, I can tell you why that is fairly, I'll, I'll take one minute to do that. Please. Well, the proposition that's in, instantiated, for example, in this, in this particular visual, which is a good representation of the, of the philosophy of the policies, is that there's no causal relationship between the, these four dimensions of identity, and, and that's palpably absurd. I mean, 98% of people it's 99.7% of people who inhabit a body with a given biological sex identify with that biological sex. It's, it's, they're t incredibly tightly linked. If, if you can't uh, attribute causality to a link that that's tight, that's <coughs> that tight, you have to dispense with the notion of causality altogether. And then of the people who, who identify, say, as male or female, who are also biologically male or female, the vast majority of them have the sexual preference that would go along with that, and the gender identity, and the gender expression. 
these, these levels of analysis are unbelievably tightly linked, and the, the evidence that biological factors play a role in determining gender identity is, in a word, overwhelming. There isn't a serious scientist alive who would dispute that. Now, you get, you get disputes about it, but they always stem from, essentially, from the humanities. And as far as I'm concerned, I, I've looked at it very carefully. Those arguments are entirely ideologically driven. It's a tenant of the ideology that identity is socially constructed. And that's partly why it's been instantiated into law. Because there's no way they're going to win the argument. But they can certainly win, let's say, the propaganda war, especially by foisting this sort of reprehensible uh, advertising information on children. And that's part of the, that's part of the express intent. I would add that the trans, uh, uh, trans complainants have been covered under the existing grounds of sex before the tribunals across uh, Canada. And as the Minister of Justice said, they are uh, bringing this legislation in as a symbolic gesture. And so uh, I leave it to you to question what that gesture may be. But, but uh, this community has been protected under the existing grounds that are, are found in most of the human rights codes across, uh, across Canada on the grounds of sex. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Joel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Brown or Mr. Peterson, the, uh, uh, Justice Wagner from the Supreme Court in a seminar at the Ottawa University uh, in early March of this year, which was a couple of months ago, uh, stated the following. Of course, he was not uh, giving a decision from the bench, you know, but he was expressing his views. And if you allow me, I will quote him. It's short. When the court eventually faces a question touching on transgender identity, these two propositions will provide essential frames of reference. First one, that identity is not fixed, but changing. That's the first proposal. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, that identity is not innate, but contextual. I repeat, that identity is not innate, but contextual, uh, end of quote. Um, I, I, I read that and I try to understand the implication uh, of this, you know, those two binary kinds of, uh, of uh, elements that, and he says the court, so I bet that he might have spoken to colleagues or, you know, the profession generally. Would you, would you have a quarrel with that kind of approach to the definition of transgender? Uh, reality, or if you think that it's a proper uh, way of approaching legally the issues, because as you forcefully explain, uh, somebody one day might challenge, uh, you know, the proposal, the policies, uh, and all the, what would, could stem from the enactment of those legislations. So, in other words, we'll find ourselves in the court one day, and we will have to, or you know, to analyze and argue the case at least taking into account that references, that those references that Justice Wagner mentioned not long ago. So how you you react to that uh, okay. well, I want to way make, of perception? I want to make sure I understand your question properly. So when, when the Justice said this, was he implying that uh, the identity is not fixed but it is changing and that identity wasn't innate and it was contextual or was he outlining the, 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 the arena within which this debate might take place no it was essentially it was you know it was not a speech on this essentially it was more if i can use an expression that mr brown will understand it was rather an obiter you know in a conference the conference was about identity but of course uh, since uh, you know identity is a topic of common on you know yeah. not common debate in canada he felt that uh, it was helpful if he would you know I should say, put his grain of salt in the in the in the public debate by establishing what he thinks is, you know, how to define transgender identity and establish some parameters. Okay, so let's let's assume that it is changing and contextual. Yeah. Okay, then why is conversion therapy a problem? Mm. See, this is what. See, the thing is, is that. When I started opposing this bill, people immediately assumed that I was transphobic and racist and all these other epithets that they're perfectly willing to trot forth at a moment's notice. But you know, there's been a tremendous attempt to make conversion therapy for people who are gay illegal, right? And the proposition is predicated on the idea that the identity, the sexual preference identity is not 
changing nor contextual. Mm -hmm. It's fundamental, and really what that means is that it's grounded in something like biology. It's okay, fine, let's scrap that, okay? Now it's gonna be changing and contextual. Mm -hmm. Okay, then why can't it be changed with context? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, but this is part of the problem with the policies is they're so incoherent that they're going to work against the people that they're designed to protect. Mm -hmm. Now, people have a hard time believing I care about that, but you know, the fact that I've been called things doesn't mean that that's what I am. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people who have, let's call it a non-standard identity, the, the tightest argument they have for public acceptance of that identity is that it's powerfully constrained by biological processes that are beyond their voluntary control. So, instantiate this view of humanity, the social constructionist view of humanity, and you can wave those claims goodbye because they're completely, um, they, they are at complete odds with the social constructionist viewpoint. And I think that's a big mistake. And I, I really do believe that that will backfire hard against the people who this legislation is designed to protect. Mm -hmm. If it's mutable, changeable, only subjective and, and transformable on a whim, then why should anyone have any respect for it? Gentlemen, I'm going to have to intervene. The hour has flown by, and we uh, all very much appreciate your appearance here today and your testimony as well. Thank you. We'll suspend briefly before hearing from our next witnesses. Get the audio going, Aaron. Yes. So, sorry about that, gang. I'm going to start wearing the headset. That's the only way to make sure that I can always be telling what's happening. So I'm going to have to be one of those dorks wearing the headset instead of my little earpiece here. So a lot of fun today. Jordan Peterson's engaging. The Senate is, is not uh, independent. It, it definitely is influenced by caucuses. Like, it's so ridiculous, that stuff. We met a few new people today. Um, great. Uh, I understand True Blue getting fed up like that and, and cursing. Man, I curse these guys all the time in my mind. We try to keep that shit out of the chat. We've got a few words here, pretty simple, that we try not to put on here. That's it. If not, someone's probably going to ask you not to say that again. We avoid the F word, we avoid the C word, we avoid the N word. There's a lot of other words, I'm sure, that you could test us, but don't do that. Like, we're just trying to have fun. Like, there are people that can't handle that, and again, it's pretty easy to avoid. We are trying to keep it real at the same time, but it's just tough. I understand True Blue as well, but... Like, cause I, man, I'm cursing at these people in my mind all the effing time, but we can be creative about it and say effing or something other than having it. But I do understand it. Like, I'm not going to lie. I'm a human being. I, these guys tire me out all the time. So that's about the end of our wrap up. Uh, if, where are we here? So if I have anybody that is, Online, I'm going to jump into my Facebook. If anybody wants to call in and, and, and do a quick wrap-up with me, all they need to do is uh, call me on the Facebook. Um, I've got a couple of people that I'm friends with here that could be watching on Facebook, and I think we can do this right now. We'll see. I guess not. I guess not. We're not going to wait too long. Anyways, it's been a fun afternoon. Um, we will be back tomorrow, like uh, 3 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time. Uh, that's when we're going to be going. I don't know what we're going to do yet. Um, but we are going to have fun. Just watch some Canadian politics. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I did. Like, that first video was really interesting. Give a shout out to, uh, what's the name of that? What was the name of that? channel uh street i forget the name of the channel but it, 
check them out. Like, go back into the video um, and find them. If you like that video, subscribe to their site. They've got, th those guys do make great quality videos, different than what we do here. Um, apples and oranges, but sort of in the same direction. I guess not apples and oranges. Well, they taste good together. Anyways, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you all so much for watching. And we're going to wrap it up. That's it. We'll be back tomorrow. Maybe we'll make a couple of more videos this evening. We've got a couple of things I'm going to try with a couple of friends. And to try to improve the broadcast when we start the question periods again the week after next. We're back next week, but there won't be question periods. It'll be something else. I have ideas already on what we're going to do tomorrow. We'll wait and see. Hope you all can tune in. Um, that is it. I'm Aaron, Question Period Canada Man. It is fun hanging out with you guys. That's it. Like, this is a pretty quiet uh, broadcast for, like, the last couple of weeks. We've been having some pretty great numbers. But it's Saturday of an Easter extra long weekend, so we'll take it. It's just fun to hang out with you guys. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you, Flips. Thank you. There's so many people. Grimes family. Donald Logan. Uh, Instagram. Investigating Insulator, Angus, Jeremy, who's new to the channel. There are so many people. Mike Tremblay wasn't here today, I don't think. Uh, Dive Curb Canada, always. Who else? Sky, it's nice to meet you. Um, hopefully, we'll get to chill. Scott Campbell, you're interesting. Um, we're growing something here, guys, and we like to watch these videos together. Lamonte, thank you for always tuning in. Yeah, we're just going to get going, guys. I, if I miss anybody, that's not, you're not being discluded. I just missed you. We'll get you next time. Thank you so much for watching. Got to get something to eat. Have a great weekend, guys. Try to stay warm. Catch the next video. It's fun, guys.